This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation with James O'Brien. Morning. I don't know. I don't. I, I don't know where to start now. I hadn't heard that clip before. That, that who was he? The former Conservative Party treasurer saying this bloke can't be a racist because he's been he's been abroad. That's a huge get off for the I don't know the international slave. He can't possibly be a racist. That massive slaver over there because he used to sa- he used to sail his ships to Africa to pick up human cargo. I I'm a bit discombobulated actually. I thought I know I knew where I was going to go at the beginning of the show this morning. And I thought I was going to tell you something about presenting radio phone-ins in a medium that has historically been quite racist. Um, but I don't, because I thought... God, I'm, I, I don't know what this is. Naivety, white privilege, idealism, patheticness, ignorance. I thought this was a story that was, if you like, indefensible. I honestly thought because you know i've had to i've done this job now for 20 years i have experienced colleagues examining instances and examples of blatant and rancid racism and turning them into phone-ins about whether it's really white people always whether it's really racist or gosh why don't these people just get over themselves or oh god what everyone's playing there and few people have been on the receiving end of more of that abuse in public life in those 20 years than diane abbott politician for whom i have immense admiration on one level for for what she has achieved for the doors that she has opened for the for the travails that she has faced but i am not actually a fan of of the the third act of her political career which which i think was deeply regrettable that's that's my political opinion but you know what i'm not a fan of kemi badenoch but if someone said that she makes me hate all black women i would i would gallop to her defense i'm not particularly i don't know james cleverly's mum but if someone were to come out and say that she it, she makes me want to hate all black women and if i see her on the television i think she should be shot i'd i'd i i mean, I'd, I'd be uncontainable in my fury on his behalf and my defense of british values in this sort of context so i honestly thought that a man saying that diane abbott should be shot and that she made him quotes just want to hate all black women represented a rubicon of sorts i honestly thought that it would be impossible for me to come on air today and feel a patriotic responsibility to push back against people claiming that this isn't racist. I have often felt like that at 10 o'clock in the morning during the course of my career on this radio station. I have often thought that it falls to me today to say, please stop pretending this isn't disgusting. Please stop pretending that this is evidence of uh, unfounded grievances. But I honestly thought that this was... Such an obvious... Do you know what? It's so gross, I'm not even going to use the word egregious, which I use about 40 times a day. This is just gross. It's, it's actually... I, do you know, when Sadiq Khan was sat here last week and he used the word heartbreaking, because I do what I do for a living, there's a little bit of me that thinks politicians that go there are taking quite big risks. They are exposing themselves. They are exposing their vulnerabilities. But I've interviewed Sadiq Khan more times than I can remember, more times than I've interviewed any other politician. He comes in every month, as you know, and and answers your calls. Um, A a, a decision based in part on the fact that other people were full square behind Zach Goldsmith's racist mayoral campaign uh, back when he first ran for office. And I've never seen him like that before. And I still, as a white man can't quite get my head around the use of the word heartbreaking because it becomes so personal but i believed him his tone was unique in all the time that i've all the times that i've had him in the studio because what lee anderson said was profoundly and disgustingly racist to say that because of your origins because of your uh if you like characteristics over which you have no control because of the family and the skin Uh, that you were born into you must be a terrorist or a terrorist sympathizer or in the hands in the pocket of 
Hamas supporters. It's all of the subtext of what 30p belched is clear to see. And and you just felt, and I didn't get it today. I, I don't owe Sadiq Khan an apology. But I didn't fully understand until today what he meant by heartbroken. Because it meant, I think, that he was still surprised. I won't tell you the contents of the inboxes in these studios when politicians like Sadiq Khan and Diane Abbott are either in our company or under discussion. They make your Twitter feed look positively saccharine, right? These people are out there. There are not as many of them as we sometimes fear, but the idea that they are confined to the lower orders or the socio-economic fringes of society is probably the most disgusting lie that right-wing politicians have ever told in this country. People that went to public school, people that uh, have inherited wealth, people that run multi-million pound companies are as, if not more likely to be possessed of the sort of disgusting opinions voiced by this monstrous man, Frank Hester, as anybody else in the country. People like Rishi Sunak like to push people like Lee Anderson to the front of the crowd and pretend that he somehow represents working class values, that pursuing the racist vote is somehow a class-based decision, when it is, of course, nothing of the sort. But until today, I thought there were lines that you could not cross. I really did. It's why I'm more upset and more angry this morning than I was last night. And listen, don't get me wrong, I am white. God knows what I'd be feeling today if I was not. But for a man who gave £5 million to the Tory party last year and £5 million to the Tory party this year to remark that Diane Abbott should be shot is a new dawn, I'm afraid. It's a place I never thought we'd go to. And I've written bloody books about how far and how fast we have fallen. And then, and then I came into the studio and heard this man, Lord Marland, a former Tory party treasurer, speaking to our, our own, our very own Henry Riley earlier this morning. And, and I, and I realised I was wrong. I realised there are people out there who are going to pretend that describing Diane Abbott as somebody who makes you want to hate all black women. All black women is somehow immune from accusations of sexism or racism. And that calling for an elected politician to be shot is somehow not extremism. So for a moment, for a nanosecond, indulge me, please. And imagine a banner at a pro-Palestinian peace march last weekend that said, very simply, Kami Badenoch should be shot. What would happen? Where would that story be today? Because the story about Diane Abbott, said by a Tory party donor, not some random Anorak Herbert on a march surrounded by people who find his banner as disgusting as you do. A Tory party donor, a £10 million Tory party donor, saying in company that Diane Abbott should be shot. Where would the story be today if it had been a banner about a black Tory politician on a Palestinian peace march? Where would it be? Because the mail's got it filed away, tucked away somewhere in the back of the paper. Ditto the Times, ditto the Telegraph. So I don't know what to do today on the radio because I don't know how you have a conversation about somebody being obviously and disgustingly racist when they are being defended by colleagues who claim that they're not. I mean, this is a moment that I have described to you in an almost theoretical sense over the years, when I have quoted 1984 and I've said to you, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength, war is peace. And I've always done it sincerely, but never thinking that we've quite got there. You had that front page of the Daily Express last week, Cammy Bader not claiming that Brexit's going brilliantly and it's made billions of pounds for the country. 
and now you've got a man saying that he, he, he that a black woman makes him want to hate all black women and his defense is that it's got nothing to do with race or gender I don't know how you handle this as a phone-in show. Well, what do you do? It's a bit like having a phone-in show about whether the moon is really made of cheese. Oh, here's Doris in Ongar to tell us that the moon is actually made. Who defends this monster? Who defends? I'll tell you. Lord Marland defends him. Lord Marland, who I'm not particularly familiar with, um, but I will be by the end of the next break. Lord Marland defends him like this. He's an international businessman. He travels widely overseas. He deal, does a lot of business in Jamaica. He does business in Malaysia. Uh, in Bangladesh and places like that. So he's not a racist. Uh, he made some unfortunate remarks which uh, do sound racist and quite rightly he's apologised for them. So he's not a racist <clears throat> because he's been to the Caribbean. He's not, he's not a racist. Oh, he's, he's made some unfortunate remarks that do sound racist. I'm not even sure who the worst is. Do you want to hear Mel Stride, the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions? Here he is earlier this morning. Well, it's clear that uh, what he said was inappropriate. He has, as I understand it, apologised for those remarks. I think the critical point here is I don't think what he was saying was a gender-based or a race-based uh, comment, but it was clearly inappropriate. He has apologised, and I think uh, we need to move on from that. She makes me want to hate all black women, and I think she, the black woman, should be shot, but it's not a gender-based or a race-based comment. Mel Stride, Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, not some branch manager of the BMP or a National Front Tribute Act, Secretary of State for Work and Pensions. And here's your Minister for Energy Security and Net Zero, also on Sky News. Actually, I'll play, it's quite a long clip, this. And it's even worse than the two you've already heard. So how do you do a phone-in on this? How do you do a phone-in on this without adding something to the idea that it is a debate? That it's an argument, that it's a conversation? How do you do it? Well, that's my problem. That's my problem. And the next time you hear my voice, I'll, I'll have an answer to that question. Because that's what they pay me to do. But right now... I have no words. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 20 minutes after 10. Just let people vent, James. I'm sure people will need to vent about this. Thank you, Darren. I think I will. 0345 6060973. It's a question you need to tell me how, as a black British person, this makes you feel. I, I mean, I, I hear, and I never really understand. Not completely, because I can't. But the idea that you can never do enough. You can never be enough. There'll always be that, that fear in the back of your mind that the people you're in a room with think like Stephen... think like Frank Hester thinks. There'll always be that fear, I suppose. And I don't know what that would be like. I just, I just never know what that would be like. I will never know what that would be like. Do you know, I've had, I, I remember when Nihal, the Radio 5 presenter, said something recently about walking into a room full of white people and feeling uh, discomfort. It's so blindingly obvious that he's talking about the fear that the room will contain people like this or that the room has nobody in it that you will feel a particular form of fellowship with. I've already had one idiot texting me today trying to compare those comments with with Frank Hester's. And I say idiot because I don't think that even if I was possessed of the rhetorical skills of 10 Socrateses, I don't think I could touch the sides of your racism or your ignorance. I just don't. So what does it feel like to know that the party of government has taken 10 million pounds from a man that looks at the first ever black female MP elected to the British Parliament and finds it almost impossible not to hate all black women as a consequence of her existence. In fact, so riled is he by her existence that he, he articulates a desire to see her shot. How does that make you feel? 0345 6060 973 is the number you need. I'll tell you how it makes Graham Stewart feel. Minister for Energy, Security and Net Zero. There are three minutes and 26 seconds here, and I want you to listen to every single one of them. Well, they were clearly reprehensible. He has apologised profusely and rightly and uh, tried to reach out to Diane Abbott 
um, specifically to apologise to her. It was half a decade ago. Uh, clearly, uh, those comments were wrong, um, and uh, he is right to apologise. And uh, and I think um, you know I support him doing so. Um, the Conservative Party spokesperson said. Um that Mr Hester has made clear that while he was rude, his criticism had nothing to do with the colour of her skin. Uh, is that right? Um, it, he has been absolutely clear that he, although he spoke in an intemperate well, and let me rude just read, manner, no, I, I know read he, what he said. He said, it's like trying not to be racist, but you see Diane Abbott on the television and you just want to hate all black women because she's there. I don't hate all black women, but I think she should be shot. Diane Abbott needs to be shot. I mean, that is based on the colour of her skin. And they're truly awful remarks, aren't they? So um, there's nothing I can say apart from to condemn them and say that he's absolutely right to apologise. So should the Conservative Party spokesperson yesterday have said it's got nothing to do with the colour of her skin? Well, that's clearly what he said. He used the, the wrong language. He was annoyed with Diane Abbott and was making a wide point. But I'm not, I'm not remotely tempted to try and defend it. Uh, he shouldn't have said it. Um, it was half a decade ago in a private meeting, but that doesn't really excuse it, and that's why he's quite right to apologise profoundly, profusely and completely, because those, those words are not defensible, and I'm not here today in any way to seek to defend them. So you know what my follow-up is? Should the Tory party return the money, the, the, the many millions he's, he's given, or well, are you OK to spend money that has come from him? He, he's only apologising because he's been caught out. <laughs> Yeah, and it, it's, it's obviously, as I say, deeply regrettable. But everybody, uh, you know, you, we can't cancel anybody from participation in public life or indeed donating to parties because they said something intemperate and wrong uh, in their past. And uh, it's not my decision, um, but uh, I do welcome um, uh, those who support the Conservative Party to ensure that we have Rishi Sunak, of course, our first... Hindu Prime you Minister. Welcome. The most, you welcome. We, we welcome. We welcome. You don't have welcome. to return. If you, not returning his money is something else. You're saying you welcome his money. No, I said I welcome all those who seek to ensure that our first Hindu Prime Minister stays Prime Minister and that we don't have Keir Starmer um, becoming Prime Minister of this country. So somebody else that might have said things like this in the past, you welcome their money? Um, I'm saying that I welcome those who contribute and I'm not here to sit in judgment on one remark uh, which, however, deeply inappropriate. Yeah, but you've but said that after we've been discussing the specific point. I mean, I, I, don't, I yeah. don't mean to sort of tie people in knots and push on these things. I just, if you can clarify, should he return, should the Conservative Party return the money? I, that's not my decision to make, and clearly it's deeply regrettable that he said what he said. OK. I mean, we, we, it's, it's so interesting that we... All, all point fingers uh, between different parties and, and sort of scream from the rooftop when somebody else does it and, and then seemingly try and find ways out um, from some, something that's, that's wrong here. I mean, uh, anyway, I don't know what, what more we can do on this particular point. So uh, I think we should, should perhaps leave on that uh, topic. I do. I, I know what more you can do. Not in that moment. Will Frost at Sky News there doing a brilliant job, I felt. But what you do is keep asking every single member of this government the same questions about this man and his racism until something actually happens, until we see some consequences uh, a, 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 a occur. Following actions, following words, following calling for an elected British politician to be shot. Just like, of course, the late Joe Cox was by a far-right terrorist. And, and speaking of other politicians, let me, let me use a conservative, perhaps, to make this point again. I, imagine if I came on the radio today, or imagine if the, a, a secret recording of me emerged, saying it's like trying not to be anti-Semitic, but you see Edwina Curry on the TV, and you're just like, I hate you. You just want to hate all Jewish women because she's there. Hey, and I don't hate all Jewish women at all, but I think she should be shot. Just imagine that. Imagine that for a minute. Where would we be today? I'm not necessarily, as some of you are telling me to, endorsing the notion of a hierarchy of racism in this case. I'm, I'm, I'm endorsing double standards in this case. If a left-wing politician or a major Labour donor was heard to be saying that about a Jewish female politician, in this case I've, I've chosen Edwina Curry because she was the first one that popped into my mind, uh, and she's a Tory, you know, if, if it had been Luciana Berger or Margaret Hodge. I, I just wouldn't have any different sense of disgust, any different sense of shock. If, 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 if this Hester character, if this Frank Hester character had been talking about Kemi Badenoch, I would not be more or less disgusted than I am that he was talking about Diane Abbott. And I thought that was the point that Frost made brilliantly there. 
these people seem to have. I mean, Sunak was standing on the steps of Downing Street last Friday talking about values and, and, and tolerance and diversity and how important it is to resist extremism. He's got £10 million in his back pocket from a man who wants Diane Abbott to be shot. But he can't possibly be racist because he once went to the Caribbean on holiday or something. I, I, it's just, just extraordinary. Normally when I feel like this, I, I say to you something like, I'm not going mad, am I? Or I haven't missed something, have I? I'm not doing that today. It, it's so weird, this. It's like I'm on rails. It, it's, it's objectively disgusting. Truly, truly vile. And so far, Mel Stride, Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, Graham Stewart, Minister for Energy Security, and Lord Marland, a former party treasurer, and, and uh, hmm, big, big, big-time investor in Cambridge Analytica, have come out to say... Eh, yeah, all right, you know, move along, we'll keep the money. Richard's in Wilson Forest. Richard, what would you like to say? Right, listen, I, I, am. I, I was listening, I was, <laughs> sorry, listen, I was listening, I was listening to the, the, the bloke on the TV this morning on TV AM. Yeah. And listen, I, I'm, I'm a black guy, right? And I'm listening to him and it beggars belief how these so-called intelligent people do not call it out for what it is. I mean, I just don't know how you, you, you know, uh, listen, you're doing a brilliant job, but I just don't know how they allow these people to get away with this nonsense. How can you turn around and say, uh, you know, Diane Abbott, you know, would make me feel like to, to, I dislike all black women. You might as well say all black, all black men as well, yeah, right? Yeah. I mean, and, and the geezer, remember, he's given 10 million quid. Of course they're not, of course they're not going to call him out because he's got his hand in their pocket. Right, but at the end of the day, they all know what it is. It's, it's a disgrace for for you guys to even listen to that nonsense. You, what you're supposed to be doing is just holding them to the sword and saying, "Listen, I don't want to hear your nonsense." Right? Yeah. It is what it is. Any a blind man can see what it is. And and furthermore, if you're coming out, just imagine somebody in the workplace at the minute. Right? Yeah. They've these these they've come. These politicians have come on the TV and gone. Oh no, we could, we've just said. Well, Diane Abbott should be shot, and she makes me dislike all black women, right? However, there's an incident at work, right, in a normal, just a normal company, and then the, the black woman goes, well, he's just gone and said that to me. Oh, no, well, it's not racist, because didn't you hear the, the politician the other day say it's not racist? It's got nothing to do right? with skin colour. Oh, come on, listen, listen, it's an absolute joke. And to be honest with you... You know, I just don't understand how these people get lip served, you know, be given the right to even speak. It's despicable, right? I mean, and to say you want somebody's... Listen, there's one thing. First and foremost, what he has said, what he's come out and said, it, are his true inner feelings. You don't... Whether you say this thing in common... It's like me saying, I hate all white people. I mean, I want Dreamer saying that because that's not how I feel, yeah. right? So I would What I will tell you is I don't like dogs. Right, and I, I, gen, I don't, I don't like dogs. Right, I dislike dogs. Right, because I'm not a dog lover. Right, and I've said that because I mean it. But to turn around me as a black person say I don't like white, I mean it's disgusting. It's not, or I don't One, like Richard. I don't like Richard. And I tell you what, Richard, no, no, I don't, I don't like there's Richard. Too many people like me. There's so much so, like so much so yeah. that you make me want to hate all black men. <laughs> oh, listen, no, but seriously, it's an absolute joke, mate. I and know. to be honest with you, anybody, listen, yeah. anybody who comes on and tries to defend no, that. No, no, I'm not doing that today, mate. I'm not. It's not a debate. It's not a phone in. What, 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 no, listen, and you're 100% right. It isn't a conversation because at the end of the day, it's clear what it is. It's very clear. She makes me want to hate all black women. Oh, his com her, his comments have nothing to do with skin colour. I, I mean, it is oh, beyond, me. it's beyond parody. It's beyond satire. But, it's beyond mickey taking. But, uh, it, well, it is, and it, 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 you know, listen, I can't use the P word, but it is a P take, right? Oh, there it, we it, go. It, <laughs> there are a lot of P words, Richard, thank you. And thank you, actually, for, for, for crystallising my thoughts on this. You and Darren between you, you're right. This isn't a conversation about uh, dialogue or debate. This isn't uh, whatever Mel Stride and Graham Stewart and Lord Marland and no doubt before the day is over, a few other senior Tories as well. This isn't about them trying to pretend that a comment about a black woman making you want to hate all black women has nothing to do with skin colour any more than a comment about a Jewish woman making you want to hate all Jewish women. Uh, you could realistically claim it was a comment that had nothing to do with religion or Judaism. It's just disgusting. It's just disgusting. Let's just 
have a chat together today in the hope of, I don't know, I, 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 properly recognising the sheer scale of how low the Tory party has gone and how disgusting this man is and how outrageous it is that they haven't immediately, immediately disassociated themselves from him and either returned the money or donated it to a suitable charity. Can you think of a reason why they haven't done that? Because I can think of 10 million. Thomas Watts has your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 10.37, you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Um, I've got so much to say, so much I want to un unravel and work out, but I think for, for the time being at least, this, is, this isn't really my show today, it's yours. So I'll stay stumped for a bit. Yasmin's in Richmond. Yasmin, what would you like to say? Hello, James. Hi. James, James, <laughs> I am so... I am so angry and so upset, you know, because I'm a black woman and this is the first time I'm hearing about this. And, you know, first of all, I, I just thought, is this a joke? I, did, is, this, is this really happening? Did this creature really say that? And then I want to ask about then why, when he said that at the time, why wasn't he arrested for what he said? Because isn't it incitement? Because he's actually committing some sort of crime to say, OK, let's go and, 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 and I feel like shooting her. Should the police have not spoken to him? Well, it would need to Where be reported. And it, and it was a speech yeah. reportedly given uh, 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 mm. um, to his own workforce, to his own... Um to his own staff. So, I, I, I mean, you, you, you raise mm. questions. And, and I don't know w w what the threshold yeah. is for a police investigation, yeah. but I was reading about someone who, who, who mm. was investigated by the police only yesterday mm. I was reading because he sent a raccoon emoji to a, to, to a black conservative <laughs> politician. And, you know, I presume oh. that's a, ra a racist yeah. reference, but it, it suggests the bar... At mm. the moment, if it's low mm. enough for that to be a potential offence, then calling for a black MP to be shot largely because she's black, would, would yeah. you'd, you'd imagine it would be as well? Absolutely. It's just so outrageous. And I can't... It doesn't matter that it was, you know, a decade ago. This has come out now. And I mean, is this what the Tory party... Are these the type of creatures that... It wasn't, it wasn't a Tory decade party. ago. It was, it was in 2019. It was, it was, well, it was well, you know, well, the, the, right. the Boris Johnson or Theresa May were Prime Minister and the, the current cabinet right. were all members of the Parliamentary Conservative Party. This is, Makes this, it even worse. Yeah, no, I know, but I don't, I don't want anyone letting Mel Stride or Graham Stewart put that cruddy old light. It was half a decade ago. We should all move on now. I, I just want to yeah. nip that in the bud. Uh, Absolutely, absolutely. And I just feel that somebody should deal with it. You know, I mean, what's Rishi Sunak saying? What, what, what's, he, what's he saying? You know, he's not, I, I can't hear anything from him. You know, I can't see anyone coming on the radio to actually speak about this, to address this. It's not fair for people to just to think they can just sweep this under the carpet. You know, we'll have one day I'm talking about it over the media. And that's fine. Mm. You know, you can say this about black women because, you know, it can have an effect on us. You know, we can go out there today. I can go out there today and somebody wants to sort of, you know, throw some racist slurs at me or whatever. You know, this can have a horrible effect. Hence why I think that, you know, the Tory party should actually get up Sunak needs to get up, and somebody needs to just deal with this. It, well, it's going to be too late by, by it's going to be too late by lunchtime today, mm. isn't right. it? I mean, it, you, some may feel yeah. it's too late already, but they've already sent out ministers mm. briefed to defend it. Graham Stewart calling for people to move, calling for you, Yasmin, to move on, to yes. move on. <laughs> it's just disgraceful. It really is, and that's why I feel, you know. You know, like Sunak, so he's the PM of the choice. Stand up and say something, you know, because if it was a, a, another group or something, he'd be there defending it or, or saying something. You know, this is disgraceful. No, we're not going to move on. We shouldn't forget this. And they're always picking on Diane Abbott all the time. Yes. You know, leave her alone. Leave She's her alone. She's not even a Labour MP anymore we... after her own yeah. very, very ill-advised comments about... The, the experience of racism, but, you know, if Keir Starmer can sling Diane Abbott out of the Parliamentary Labour Party uh, for, for comments that were obnoxious and uh, uh, diminished the reality of anti-Semitism, if, if Keir Starmer can do that, what the hell is Rishi Sunak's problem today? I mean, what is the problem here? It, and I'm, I'm afraid it, it was a bit glib when I said I can think of 10 million reasons, 
But Rishi Sunak could comfortably plug that £10 million hole in the Tory party finances from his current account. We're barely noticing in, in much the same way that Jeremy Hunt has just donated £100,000 to Jeremy Hunt's re-election campaign. I'll say that again in case you missed it, because if you follow 80, 90 percent of the Tory leaning media in this country, you probably did miss it. Jeremy Hunt has just donated 100,000 pounds to Jeremy Hunt's re-election campaign. Uh, and, and that story that Yasmin just reminded me of is worse than I thought. A, bl a black man has been acquitted of hate crime charges after sending a raccoon emoji to a prospective conservative MP on social media in a case that fueled mounting concerns that anti-racist legislation is now being weaponized against ethnic minority groups, reported Nadine White, the uh, rather splendid race correspondent at the um, independent newspaper, now, of course, online. A 26-year-old man reported to the police by a um, conservative candidate, not an MP, forgive me, the prospective MP for Huntingdon called Ben Obese Jekti, who is of mixed black-white heritage. Um, and it, it is, because a raccoon is black and white, it's a term that has similar repercussions and ramifications to to slurs like coconut or uh, you, so you don't need me to explain perhaps why it is um a loaded image but he 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 went to court and he he was acquitted in 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 court he was in wood green crown court in february where a white majority jury returned a not guilty verdict on both counts after a three-day hearing you can go you can end up in court for sending a raccoon emoji as a black man to a mixed race or a black candidate, Tory candidate. But you can give £10 million to the Tory party and call for a black Labour MP to be shot and get told to move on by Graham Stewart. Grace is in Haywards Heath. Grace, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Hello. <coughs> Sorry. Do you know all this, when I saw it in the papers yesterday, Yes. my first reaction was my god why would he think and black woman would want to look at him either <laughs> it's so annoying and it's been so normalized now in what places everywhere if you're black you do something i mean i work in care homes but right. if you try to say anything in terms of you know races oh there he goes you know he's getting out the race card and all you know and all that but the thing is People in higher places, once it's been normalized, it trickles down in society, you know. And they think that black people, we are just there to be doormats or, or something you hit and hit and hit, and it doesn't fight back. Now, I was on the news this morning listening to his mates. Oh, they should, you know, just forget about it. He didn't mean it because... He's, he's not been, a racist because he's done business in the Caribbean. Oh, he's been on, you know, on holiday to Jamaica. Mm. Unfortunately, James, I've heard that story again. Some of my again. best friends are black, Grace. Uh, exactly. That's, that's, the, that's the equivalent, family. really, isn't it? Some of yeah. my business contacts are black, so James, I can't possibly be if, racist. Even in my family, you mm. know, a close cousin, you know, of my brother-in-law, because, you know, mixed race and he's saying oh how can i be racist because my you know my niece is uh sorry my nephew you know is is black and i'm yeah. like are you for real it's been so normalized and do you know what we're so used to it now you just see the sunny you know funny side of it and what i saw yesterday i looked at him in you know the photo and he's like why would i even want to look at you I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not being mean, but us black women, we also are choosy. And they're trying to <laughs> dehumanise. <laughs> sorry. That's, no, that's Try, perfect. Yeah. Of course they're trying to dehumanise. I mean, you can't get much more dehumanised than being shot, can you? It's, yeah, uh, it's, uh, because he's got, he thinks he's got money. He can talk about us the way he wants. But I tell you what, James, mm. I want to have a look at him and tell him that, do you know what, mate? I don't think any black woman would be interested, would even give you a look, you know, if I found him down the road. Seriously. I'll pass that on. Stop. I'll pass that Please on, do. Grace. I shall, I'll make, I'll make sure he receives that message loud and clear. And, and, and thank you for b b managing to retain a modicum of levity when we're discussing such a serious story, because that's, that's the only way you can avoid your head exploding sometimes, isn't it? By keeping a... Just keeping one foot on the on the on the levity pedal, but my God, it's hard today. And if it's hard for me as a white commentator, God knows what it's like for people 
listening to this from a perspective of personal experience or deep, deep learned knowledge. And if you're just joining us or if you're not across this story, I sometimes make a, a, a mistake of thinking everyone's as immersed in the news agenda or social media brouhaha as I am. There is a man called Frank Hester in the news today. He runs a company called the Phoenix Partnership, which has made millions upon millions upon millions of pounds from looking after patient records in the UK. Um, and he has given some of the millions upon millions of millions of pounds upon which he's made as a consequence of receiving contracts from largely conservative governments governments. He's given 10 million of those pounds back to the Conservative Party um, in order to help them fight the next election campaign. And uh, uh, just five years ago at a meeting uh, within his own company, he explained that he tries not to be racist, but when he sees Diane Abbott on the TV, he just wants to hate all black women. I'll say his name again. Uh, his name is Frank Hester. His company is called Phoenix Partnership. And he tries not to be racist. <clears throat> Can we all take a moment to feel sorry for Frank's efforts not to be racist? He tries not to be racist. We know because he said so. But then Diane Abbott comes on the television. And he just has to hate all black. He just can't help himself. He's, de he's definitely not racist. Tries really hard also not to be racist. But then Diane Abbott pops up on the telly and, oops, a daisy, I hate all black women. And it's like... I <laughs> It gets worse, of course. It gets worse. She's stupid. Oh, it's not as good as her dying. It would be much better if she died. I don't know if he's talking about her or Diane Abbott now because the, 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 the tirade began when he was discussing a, a female executive at another country. So that executive, in brackets, all right. The executive and Diane Abbott need to be shot. She's stupid. If we can get her being unprofessional, we can get her sacked. It's not as good as her dying. It would be much better if she died. She's consuming resource. She's eating food other people could eat, you know? That is mostly directed at the um, executive from another company that he was talking about to his colleagues, but somehow Diane Abbott ends up being brought into the desire to see people being shot. Um, and, but remember, please, when he says that Diane Abbott makes him hate all black women, it's got nothing to do with skin colour. It's uh, 10.49. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 10.53 is the time. Briefly, because I want to get back to the calls, I, 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 I never know. So I could take some solace today from the fact that Idiot's Corner is very quiet. There are one or two people who are being outwardly and explicitly racist, which is fine. That happens every day. But there aren't that many. And what I haven't got is people who think that they're being clever or insightful, seeking to defend what Frank Hester has said and what Frank Hester has done with regard to Diane Abbott. So there's part of me that thinks, well, that's quite encouraging because even the kind of people that... that maybe get in touch with me on less obvious, less blatant examples of racism and seek to defend it or claim that it's not important. Even they know that this is disgusting. But of course, if it goes unpunished, then I think that you have a, a, a shift in the Overton window. If it goes unpunished, then the message being sent to the country, to all of the country, is that it's okay to say things like this. Or at the very least, that it's all right. It's okay to say things like this as long as you've got a spare ten million quid to drop in Rishi Sunak's pocket. It's, it's it's extraordinary. So I'll do it again. I'll do the counterfactual again, if you don't mind, just to show you how disgusting this is in the context of conversations that we've been having recently about anti-Semitism. Quite rightly, um, it's like trying not to be anti-Semitic, but you see Edwina Curry on the TV, and you're just like, I, I hate. You just want to hate all Jewish women because she's there. And I don't hate all Jewish women at all, but I think she should be shot. And now Lord Marland is here to tell us why that's got absolutely nothing to do with Judaism. Or that he doesn't believe that that comment was made by an anti-Semitic person. And he knows this person isn't anti-Semitic because he once went to Marks and Spencers. Or he did some business with Israel. Uh, that, that is how obvious and how disgusting it is. And that is why today you are not hearing me at any point say, is it just me or am I going mad or what am I missing? You're just hearing me say, this is disgusting. And if Rishi Sunak does nothing, the country is diminished. If Rishi, not, if Rishi Sunak does nothing, then we all lose. But people who are black lose even more than the rest of us. Which is why I would be very keen to hear from Kemi Badenoch or James Cleverly or indeed Ben Obese Jekti, this candidate who um, saw a man that sent him a raccoon emoji in Crown Court on racism charges 
uh, just last month. He, he also added his voice, I'm reading, to those uh, claims you'll remember from last year that, uh, that a contestant on University Challenge who had an octopus mascot in an episode filmed last March was somehow being anti-Semitic in the context of a terrorist attack in Israel that occurred nine months later. March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, eight or nine months later. So he's quite... He's, he's, he's not backwards in coming forwards when it comes to having strong opinions. Anybody knows this fella who is standing as the MP, I think, in um, in Huntingford, then I'd be very keen to know what he thinks about the £10 million Tory donors' comments. Toyin is in Chiswick. Toyin, what would you like to say? Hi, Jane. Hello. Um, I'm so, so glad that you're um, covering this. Mm. Um, I'm a black woman. I look at myself in the mirror and I think, what is wrong with me? There's nothing wrong with me. There's nothing wrong with all the beautiful black women in this country, you know? Mm. And that statement, what he said, it chips away at you as a black woman. It chips away at your confidence. There are going to be some black women that are going to be in the kind of spaces that this man was, and they're going to be feeling so insecure. They're going to be feeling so bad about, about themselves, but they're because of the narrative that this man has try, tried to portray, to portray, and also and also going to the extent of saying that he wants. Diane Abbott to be shot, to be shot. Mm. You know, I'm stammering. I'm, I'm so upset about the whole thing. You know, I had to take, I drive my daughter into school and we usually listen to LBC in the mornings, but I, I couldn't play LBC this morning because, because you, I had to protect my child. You didn't want to have to explain it to your daughter. I didn't want her. I didn't want to explain it. I had to protect her. And I'm sure there are going to be a lot of black parents that are protecting their children yet again from this type of rhetoric. Also, um, it's very similar. The one feeling is very similar to how I felt when Jeremy Clarkson said what he said about Meghan. Yes. You know, the impact, it impacts not just black women. It impacts children that have got black mothers. So it could be mixed race children, and also, also James. Just one more thing. I've hey, been watching take, take Celebrity all the time. Big take Brother. All the time. Oh, have you, Crikey? This has taken an unexpected turn. <laughs> <laughs> I was watching um, Celebrity Big Brother, yes. and last night um, Sharon Osbourne was asked to save um, someone from eviction. Right, and. Um, one of the people was a YouTuber, a famous uh, YouTuber called ZZ Mills, a black girl. Okay. And now ZZ went into the diary room and she broke down. It, she said, look, you know, sometimes as a black woman, she's put in spaces where she has to defend herself. I, I'm not saying it verbatim, but so. it's all very similar to how we are made to feel at times and she do, didn't want to come across as the stereotypical angry b black woman yeah. that is portrayed you know globally you know i do know so that that's just what i want to say you know Thank i'm you. a Ch chiswick person <laughs> you know and there's some spaces even in chiswick that i don't feel comfortable going in because you feel this type of thing people don't have to say it but you walk into a certain um, areas, you walk into certain, you know, spaces and you feel it. It's very, very hard as a black woman and as a professional black woman where you go into spaces where there are a lot of like white men. Yes. You know, it's very, very Well, very I don't know. I don't know. Difficult. But I do know this. I do know this, that if, if at some mythical point in the past as, as, a, as a former fellow resident of Chiswick, I had sought to reassure you that you were wrong. I would be both patronising you and deploying white privilege. But mm. when, when I know that men like this 
exist and when they feel empowered and when they feel entitled and when they're in a room full of people on the payroll, they feel they have the right to come out with comments like this, then I mm. can never in a million years tell you that things aren't as bad as you think they are or, or, or aren't yeah. as bad as you fear they are. Yeah. One more thing, James. Go on. I honestly feel that it's reached the stage where the government need to either have a minister yeah. to protect black women because we're tired. Our children go through this from primary school. I've had to defend my children. You know, I've had to defend my daughters. We're tired. It has to stop. You know there that? should be a minister to protect well, there black is. women. I, I mean, t t technically there is, maybe not specifically black women, but I, but I think part of Kami Badenoch's brief is equalities, isn't it? That, that she's the person to whom you would uh, uh, technically or theoretically turn for support at a time like this. And I, I believe she's yet to comment on these, on these matters, but I'm sure she will do imminently. Although I wouldn't hold your breath. Torian, thank you. <laughs> that word tired. In fact, probably if we had the technology to do it, I think the words tired and exhausted are probably the words used most in my inbox today by, by black women, by women of colour. Uh, although for for everybody else, the word impunity keeps popping up a lot. It's word of the week, really, isn't it? Impunity. The idea was it last week, wasn't it? Michelle Donnellan. Do you remember her? The one that used fifteen grand of your money to settle a libel case against someone she accused of supporting Hamas with no evidence or, or, or justification whatsoever. That's gone away, that story. That's sailed over the horizon. All of the politicians who were queuing up to fail to explain why Lee Anderson was Islamophobic just say, oh, no, it's very inappropriate, but we should all move on now. So you're wondering why people like Graham Stewart say, suggest we should all move on now. 10 million quid in the bank. Cha-ching! Time to move on. How racist can you be for 10 million quid, lads? How racist can you be? It's almost like a party game. Isn't it? Pass the port, will you, Tristram? How racist. I've got £10 million here that says I could actually call for a black Labour MP to be shot and Tory MPs before lunchtime the following day would be calling upon the country to move on. £10 million quid says I can call for Diane Abbott to be shot and Rishi Sunak won't do anything. What the hell would you get for £50 million? James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. Six minutes after 11 is the time you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC, where we will continue to contemplate the um, the state of the nation, really, or at least the state of Rishi Sunak's government, where uh, one of their biggest donors, a £10 million donor, can call for Diane Abbott, the first black female MP to sit in the House of Commons to be shot. Um, when he can be reported to have said it's like trying not to be racist but you see Diane Abbott on the TV and you're just like I hate you just want to hate all black women because she's there and I don't hate all black women at all but I think she should be shot and you just swap those names and those characteristics for others and you know that Rishi Sunak would be giving a speech on the steps of Downing Street about how important it is that we remove this cancerous hatred from our midst. But when it's directed at Diane Abbott and all black women, and when it's coming from a £10 million Tory donor, at seven minutes after 11 on the morning after the comments were first reported, nothing so far has happened. Diane Abbott herself has uh, issued a statement in the last few minutes which says it is frightening i live in hackney and do not drive so i find myself at weekends popping on a bus or even walking places more than most mps i am a single woman and that makes me vulnerable anyway but to hear someone talking like this is worrying for all of my career as an mp i have thought it important not to live in a bubble but to mix and mingle with ordinary people the fact that two mps have been murdered in recent years makes talk like this all the more alarming and at the moment the call for Diane Abbott to be shot is for good or for ill receiving less coverage than calls or, or reports of other MPs receiving different kinds of hatred well not here it's not but elsewhere in the in the UK media and the ministers um, uh, if you like failing to properly call this out so far 
include Graham Stewart, who was humiliated, or rather humiliated himself, on Sky News this morning, um, failing to call for a return of the money or a, or a reallocation of the money, and both Labour and the Liberal Democrats now um, describing accurately. This is what I mean about this being one of those mornings where there is no debate to be had. There is no phone-in um, balance needed. There is no requirement for me to say plaintively, am I going mad or is this actually awful? Am I missing something or is this a new low? Give me a call and, and help me out. You know, all of the stuff I do authentically and sincerely when I feel that I need it, I don't need it today. There is no defence of people, of words like this, unless you're a Tory minister, in which case there are 10 million reasons why you would seek to defend this man today. And indeed, in Graham Stewart's case, have the, have the bare-faced audacity to tell people, like the women we spoke to in the first hour, to move on. To move on. Patricia's in Croydon. Patricia, what made you pick up the phone? Hi, James. Hello. I call because I'm constantly enraged um, by this government, and I want to thank you for offering visibility to black women who... There's a real paradox in terms of we are invisible when matters of safety and um, performance, you know... Yes. Poor performance, poor outcomes. And yet we've got grown used to Diane Abbott um, being subject to years of unacceptable behaviour, racism and lack of dignity. That's become normal. And your earlier caller mentioned Megan um, to, and you Jan know, Jeremy Clarkson. Yes. Yes. The inter so the interface with misogyny, but I want to thank you for offering visibility because well, I'm one of those women that, uh, yeah, thank you. I'm one of the, the women that this feeble man who would be so unable to contain himself because of the thoughts and actions that Diane would compel him mm. to, you know, consider a stranger like me so victim blaming he can't control himself you know she's so powerful yet it's okay to continually disregard our safety our dignity and think it's okay to use peculiar language to peculiar. to consider yeah james Baldwin. he saved my life because we all know that this is a culture war and we all know that division and fear is used to split us and separate us while real bad things are going on here. We, as a group of black women, we are very easy to dismiss because I don't even know how Diane stands. And when Meghan went to America, I was relieved for her safety. But I was born here. I'm one of those, I'm a northerner actually. Mm. And when I look at 30p Lee, I feel he's a disgrace because he does not represent um where i'm from and I, and the, those values but going back to this matter here we have become too used to black women being disregarded and invisible when it's convenient i i, I hadn't been, thought i had there's an element of this that i hadn't picked up on just from my position of privilege and, and that that is where you talked about him blaming diane abbott for his own loss of control as it were and that that's where misogyny and racism smash Absolutely. headlong into each other isn't it it's why the word misogynoir exists in the first place because Absolutely. he's saying i don't want to be racist but that <laughs> black woman over there she boils my blood so badly that i can't help but wanting to hate all black women it's diane abbott's fault that i <laughs> i frank whatever um, his bloody name is frank hester um that i want to hate all black women it's nothing to do with me it's nothing to do with my prejudices my bigotries my ignorance my Absolutely. failure to do the work my failure to recognize Gosh. the basic humanity of people like you patricia the reason why i want to hate all black women is because diane abbott is so uh, which i reject which is it's a lie take responsibility it's racist stop hiding behind your peculiar language and your mental gymnastics I've witnessed this with the debate within the Conservatives around uh -huh. Islamophobia. They, it's like if they don't say it doesn't exist, get real. It's about safety. It's untrue. It's factually incorrect. I reject it. And actually, if you're asking how I feel, yeah. apart from being enraged, God give me strength, literally. If it wasn't for my faith 
and my family and the people that nurtured me with love. Today I woke up and I, I had a text exchange with a couple of my friends. Yeah. I'm in my 50s, white women, We and I'm so blessed to have them because we can go there about anything. We don't have to agree. We do with each other in love. It's a real relationship. My black sisters too. But the bottom line is, I want to see leadership from all parties here because you're quite right. A complicit media is also feeding this. So I want to hear leadership from here, from other parties. This is not on too because this is a societal thing, powerful men, mm. racism. And I love the opportunity, James, for you to give us visibility today and allow me to feel better about myself because I have to, I've got a son and I'm a woman born here and I still get asked where you're from. <laughs> I'm like, yes. when you, and, and, and this needs to stop and we need to just say, hang on, not everybody's feeling this. This is unacceptable. Take responsibility. It's racism. Not playing your mental gymnastic game. Some days we'll have a debate. Your language. Some days we'll have a debate. Some days I'll need help in understanding mm. the issue. Some days we'll need to explain and balance things out and hear from somebody else claiming that this isn't the case. But not today. Not today. Today it's a. Thank you. It's a. It's a. It's a no-brainer. It is. If you'd forgive me, Patricia, it's a black and white issue today. I it? do forgive, and I want to thank you for this space. <laughs> okay, well, as I say, it's 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 your show as much as it's mine. Always has been, always will be. Some days, perhaps more than others. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. Nineteen minutes after eleven is the time. Do you remember this? We are a country where we love our neighbours, and we are building Britain together. But I fear that our great achievement in building the world's most successful multi-ethnic, multi-faith democracy is being deliberately undermined. There are forces here at home trying to tear us apart. It's like trying not to be racist, but you see Diane Abbott on the TV and you're just like, I, I hate, I hate, you just want to hate all black women because she's there. And I don't hate all black women, but I think she should be shot says the man who gave £10 million to the party led by this man. We are a country where we love our neighbours and we are building Britain together. But I fear that our great achievement in building the world's most successful multi-ethnic, multi-faith democracy is being deliberately undermined. There are forces here at home trying to tear us apart trying to tear us apart, calling for us to be shot. Rishi Sunak, of course, not there, talking about the comments of Frank Hester, who has given £10 million to Rishi Sunak's Tory party, a drop in the ocean compared to the value of the contracts that he's received from successive Tory governments. Uh, and so far, nothing really has been said. Have they said anything? Has Downing, has Downing Street said anything specifically yet on this? Have we got... Should check with Natasha probably, but um, Mel Strides had a go. He, he was speaking to Sky. He was speaking to Sky News earlier this morning. He, I mean, if you think it's shocking that Mel Stride is the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, it's my sad duty to remind you this morning that Kemi Badenoch is currently Minister for Women and Equalities. So here is a woman under racist attack from a Tory Party donor, and where is the Minister for Women and Equalities? You tell me. I don't know. Probably counting unicorns at the Daily Express editorial offices. But here's Mel Stride on Sky News earlier this morning. Well, it's clear that uh, what he said was inappropriate. He has, as I understand it, apologised for those remarks. I think the critical point here is I don't think what he was saying was a gender-based or a race-based uh, comment, but it was clearly inappropriate. He has apologised, and I think uh, we need to move on from that. She makes me want to hate all black women. All black women. Now, there's a lot of debate at the moment about gender. Uh, there is even occasionally still some debate about race. But if someone describes themselves as wanting to hate all black women, how can anybody claim that it has nothing to do with gender or race? I, I, she, she, gender makes me want to hate all black race women gender i don't know i don't know i won't inflict graham stewart on you again because it's too long but um fair play to wolf frost over at sky news for not letting him wriggle off 
The Hook and I hope other journalists, when they are presented with the opportunity to interview conservative politicians, remember how important this is. You let you let him walk. You let them all off the hook with Lee Anderson. I told you that you would and you did. Don't let them come on your show unless they will answer questions about whether or not what Lee Anderson said, whether or not Lee Anderson's Islamophobia was Islamophobic. Yet the entire Tory party has been recast in the image of Nigel Farage. It would be a shame if the British media was as well. Here's Lord Marland, a former investor in Cambridge Analytica, which played such an important role in Brexit, and who is a former Conservative Party treasurer. This is, in many ways, worse than Mel Stride's comments. He's an international businessman. He travels widely overseas. He deal, does a lot of business in Jamaica. He does business in Malaysia, uh, in Bangladesh, and places like that. So he's not a racist. Uh, he made some unfortunate remarks, which uh, do sound racist, and quite rightly, he's apologised for them. Um, if you are worried about being accused of racism and you want Lord Marlin to come to your defence, do some business in the Caribbean. Maybe open an office in, in Malaysia. There you go, and there, there he'll be, uh, coming into bat for you. Keir Starmer, leader of the Labour Party, has had his say this morning. The comments about Diane Abbott are just abhorrent. Um, Diane has been a trailblazer. Um, she has paved the way for others. She's probably faced more abuse than any other politician over the years on a sustained basis. And I'm sorry, this apology this morning that is pretending that what was said wasn't racist or anything to do with the fact she's a woman, I don't buy that, I'm afraid. And I think that it's time the Tory party called mm. it out and returned the money. Return the money. Why not? It's not as if Rishi Sunak is short of a bob or two and Jeremy Hunt's just donated £100,000 to the Jeremy Hunt re-election campaign, so the precedent's already been set. Chelsea is in Stratford-upon-Avon. Chelsea, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Hello, Chelsea. Um, I'm a, a first-time caller, but uh, hearing this story this morning just made me want to ring up because um, I, I was hearing all this anger expressed and I found that as a black woman with a so many experiences of, of racism and, and racial abuse mm. and, and and what I've been through that I almost feel numb now when I hear these things I feel so almost resigned to the fact that this government just has no respect or it could have done, it could have reassured you if they'd moved fast if they'd moved yeah. fast and, and effectively, if they'd literally said, because these words are, are not like, for me at least, and correct me if I'm wrong, but they're not like previous uh, examples. They, 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 he has mm. gone f he's gone further than I can remember anybody of sufficient or similar prominence going. And as soon as the words Diane Abbott needs to be shot reached mm -hmm. the public space, Rishi Sunak should have should have axed him, should have, should have disassociated, should have complete. I, I mean, I don't know what's happened to us all, Chelsea. It's, it's, it's disgusting. And, and when, when you referred to the, the phrase about being heartbroken, yes. like, that is how I feel right now because though, though it's, it's a threat of violence. It's a, it's a feeling of wishing someone were harmed for who they are, for who they cannot help being. And that, I, I keep refreshing the news sites like somebody's yeah. got to come out and yeah. it's, it's like a state of shock you think somebody's got to come out and say something but but they don't and so, someone's do still in power know. because you, there are some good people out there who, who have fought under the conservative flag in the past a Alistair Burt a former minister, I'll read you what he has to say. If true, and it appears to be, it is open and shut for the Conservative Party. Return the donations, end the relationship, and ask decent donors to make up the difference. With MPs under threat and past murders, this is unacceptable. Many Conservative oh, members will be watching. And I, I, think, I think, relevantly, Alistair Burt was one of the Tory MPs culled by Boris Johnson in 2019 when um, so many decent people were removed from the party by Johnson and Cummings. And look what we're left with. Not one has come forward to say what should be obvious. And, and was it not during the <clears throat> so during COVID that uh, um, black and ethnic minorities were at a disproportionate advantage? Yes. Um, and they continue to lie about that to this day. Like this government could not make in general, or at least by Rishi Sunak's lack of action, he cannot make it clearer. 
It, I mean, silence is is. I, 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 I mean, silence is extraordinary, actually, for for for, for Downing Street. I, obviously, these ministers have been briefed uh, to some level to claim there's something wrong with the words, but not the man. Uh, in in I mean, much the same way that they couldn't really explain how disgusting Lee Anderson was without putting Suella Braverman on the hook for even more disgusting words. I could see some logic in that, but the only logic mm-hmm. here is we 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 need the money. Otherwise, yeah. cut him loose. Cut him loose now. Cut him loose last night. Cut him loose yesterday. It could have been so easy. Yeah. Um, as this government right now. 10 million quid worth more than the security, safety of voters. Most obviously black women voters, black female voters like Chelsea, like most of my callers today. Gavin Barwell as well to just reassure that there are some people out there, a uh, former... Um, Chief of Staff at Number 10 under Theresa May, I think, a former minister like um, like Alistair Burt. This is an absurd line, he wrote, in response to Hester's attempt at an apology, claiming that it had nothing to do with gender or skin colour. First, Hester didn't offer any, quotes, criticism, end quotes, of Diane Abbott's views. He described his reaction to seeing her on TV. Second, what he said clearly had something to do with her gender and the colour of her skin, because he referenced both of them. I, I mean, you know, if I called you fat and then said that my comment had nothing to do with your size, I would be in a similar philosophical space to where Frank Hester finds himself this morning. But I haven't given 10 million quid to the Tory party. So Graham Stewart and Mel Stride and Lord Marland wouldn't be queuing up to defend me. It's, 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 it, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I mean, it is just extraordinary. And that phrase, which I didn't say out loud, but a few of you have picked up on the fact that I nearly did. Silence is violence, isn't it? Silence is violence. Silence is actually compounding the offence. You're Diane Abbott and the Prime Minister and the Equalities, the Women and Equalities Minister, Kemi Badenoch, have said nothing so far. What is the point of a Minister for Women and Equalities if they stay silent when an elected politician comes under attack for both her gender and her race. What, what does equalities mean? What does women mean? They're always asking that question, aren't they? Well, here you go. Here's a woman being treated in the most profoundly unequal fashion. Kemi Badenoch, no doubt, just stuck in traffic, is she? Any minute now, the Minister for Women and Equalities will come out and call this what it is. Disgusting, sexist racism of the kind that only black women can experience because of that curious combination of misogyny and prejudice. Which is why other callers have, of course, reminded us of Jeremy Clarkson and his comments about Meghan Markle. Thomas Watts has your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. Uh, fair play to Amjad, who, who um, responded to Frank Hester's attempt to claim that he can't possibly be racist because he was the child of Irish immigrants. Um, uh, he, he called it. He said, oh, I see he's gone for the Irish child immigrant defence. He may as well say, I'm not a bigot. I love Jamaican patties. Well, Lord Marlon did that for him. He said he can't possibly be racist because he does business in Malaysia. Don't you know? Uh, which is great, isn't it? Because the East India Company wasn't racist. It means that the sugar plantations, right? so the people, the, the English entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, the, the, Eng, the English aristocrats that owned the sugar plantations in the Caribbean, they couldn't possibly be racist because they own sugar plantations in the Caribbean. It's a great defence, isn't it? I, I, I think one of the great mysteries of our time, one of the great damaging myths of our time, and it's an odd thing to say, I, I, I wish that I had made millions of pounds, right, so that I could say this without anybody being able to suggest that I don't know what I'm talking about. But uh, trust me, all right, to make a ton of money, you don't have to be either clever or nice. In fact, in some markets, being clever or nice is a major obstacle to making a ton of money. We've got this weird forelock-tugging deference to both inherited status, which is mad enough, and inherited wealth, which is even madder, and earned wealth, which isn't quite as mad as the other two, but is still mad. Somebody makes a ton of money, we think they're possessed of skills other than the ability to make a ton of money, usually through exploitation of some kind. If, if you're making absolute fortunes, you are usually dealing in people, in, uh, in arms or in information. You've found a way of monetizing things that under my glorious rule would be free. 
But I digress. The bottom line is this. To make an absolute fortune, you do not have to be possessed of any skills that are to the benefit of broader society. And if you're then giving millions of pounds to the party that you want to be in power, the chances are you're doing it because you think that's the party that will make you richer. That's the end of my TED talk. Wayne's in Woodford. Wayne, what would you like to say? Good morning. Um, hello, Wayne. First of all, hello. First of all, I'm a first time caller. So, um, Welcome. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, you touched on a lot of subjects, but this one here is the one that I've, I've decided to call in because I just think it's, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm angry and frustrated. Um, not 100% surprised and, and no longer shocked, especially with this uh, particular government. Yeah. Um, now, this guy who's paid ten million pounds, we you know Richard. We know Richard you Sunak's know, not going to going to say anything because it's money, and because I think Richard Sunak's a very weak. Person. Are you sure? Are you sure? How, how sure. shocked would how shocked would you be if he did if something came out in the next before before tea time if they did move uh, on this? Well, I'd be pretty, very very shocked. Be would more you shocked really? than that than what's been said? Yeah. Okay. Um, but but the, the privilege of of these sort of people, white people. Um, and business people, they will come on. If somebody who's a black woman, yeah. was he was to interview that particular black person, and he's just, for example, maybe had a, a weekend with Diane Abbott in the news, yeah. and then interviews a black woman on a Monday or Tuesday when it's going to be, he has that decision to make on this person's future, and he can turn around and say, I don't really want you yeah. because you're a black woman. Yeah. Well, and and I hate all black women because of that terrible diana, but she made me do it. Exactly. So, you know, it, it's so frustrating and it's so, it's it's such a racist thing. And he can sit there and do that. Um, my partner went to Barbados and she, she's white. Yeah. She went, she went on her own. And she was in the hotel, four-star hotel. She was there for about a, a week. And she's, you know, being polite to the staff and that sort of stuff, and a woman noticed what was what was going on. So she, she a couple of days later, she, the woman who approached my partner and yeah. sat with her and said, uh, said basically, you shouldn't be so nice to these people. Whoa. You should realise that they're beneath you. You should understand that they're yeah. not as good as us. So my partner just sat there in absolute shock yeah. and didn't say anything. So she. Train, but and this is a successful businesswoman. She found out who she was, and so a very successful businesswoman. Right. And I go back to this the job situation. So if this woman is interviewing a black person, yeah, it's gone. male or female, she's not going to employ that person. She's got a choice of two people. The probability not going to employ that person because of her views. And this guy's exactly the same. He. It's so frustrating to meet. And I, I, well, I mean, it, 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 just to clarify slightly, there are plenty of people on his payroll from ethnic minorities. He made a joke about some of the Chinese Absolutely. women sitting together in what he called Asian corner. Um, Absolutely. But, but you, you, you're describing a, a hierarchy of attitude. If he's going to look at yeah. a black woman uh, or, or indeed a, a Chinese, a woman of Chinese yeah. origin, he's going Absolutely. to yeah. feel differently somewhere inside from how he would yeah. when he looked at another white man. There's yeah. sexism here and, as well. We mustn't underestimate the sexism uh, or, or ignore course. the sexism. And, and uh, you know, Kimi Banner, Banner you know, she must wake up in the morning and go, I'm going to go into work today. I've got to do my job today. Yeah, yeah. And I've got to smile. Surely she must look at the mirror and go, I can't do this. She, she must, you know, she, she must look at her parents and say, you guys went through so much for me to get to this position. And here I am amongst these people. Not, not all these stories are racist or policies are racist. We know that. Yes. And I meet these people and I don't even know what, I don't know what they're thinking of. Are they looking at me going, you're just a black woman and your ceiling is here. Don't you ever forget that. I, yeah, I, I, I mean, it's just important that these points are, are, are stressed and explained even even more powerfully with those personal experiences. As what did you say to your partner when she came back and told you that story? I said to her, um, "Did you not? Did you not point out that you was a, was a, yeah. was a black person, a black man?" She said, "I did, I came here for a holiday and I didn't want to get into that deep discussion, and I could have easily said that." Um, but the fact of the matter is, this woman who's in the Caribbean, who's been served by um, black people, has basically decided, you are beneath me. Yeah. So no matter what, 
no matter how these people um um the staff are treating this woman, maybe helping her and all that sort of stuff, in her mind, you're a black person. You're not good enough. You're not as good as me. And there's nothing you can really do about that. And nothing. nothing. And, and even if you kind of mask and try to fit in and bend over backwards to accommodate the prejudices and ignore the insults and ignore the barbs, he doesn't change. He doesn't. It's a generational thing, that, which I, I was talking to Humza Yusuf a bit about it yesterday, the, the Scottish First Minister, who's a really, really impressive politician, by the way. That's this week's full disclosure. And he was talking about the generational change between his parents' generation and his generation, where parents on the receiving end of racism would sort of keep their heads down and think that they just needed to sit it out, whereas the younger generation would decide that this is not something we need to tolerate, this is not something we need to put up with. And that's why. It's because if you do sit on your head, if you do tolerate it to keep the peace, then people like Frank Hester never change, never never get held to account. Um, trying to make it, it's a very short list. Wayne, thank you, mate, for that. Um, a very short list, and at the moment it's got Alistair Burt on it and um, Gavin Barwell, both former Tory MPs, senior Tory MPs, but both, of course, no room for them in the modern iteration of the party, if you like, the post-Boris Johnson Tory party. Uh, Samuel Kasumo, not not a politician, but a former advisor to Boris Johnson on, uh, uh, I think, among other things, on, on matters race-related. He advised Boris Johnson on civil society and communities. He gave a rather powerful interview to another radio station earlier this morning in which he made some very, very powerful points about Diane Abbott's historical role in this country. He said, as a black Brit, Diane Abbott is someone who is very historically significant. He went on to explain that other senior black British Tories, including Kemi Badenoch and James Cleverley, would not have got to their positions in politics were it not for Diane Abbott. So it's very important, said Samuel Kasumu, a former advisor in Downing Street to Boris Johnson. It's very important to note that every time Diane is attacked, we do feel it. We feel a sense of hurt because of her historical significance. She ran so that people like me could walk. That's a powerful line, isn't it? She ran so that people like me, and under Samuel Kasumo's analysis, people like James Cleverley and Kemi Badenoch, she ran so that you could walk. And as yet, no comment from either of them. A uh, slight change of gear next. Uh, well, quite a profound change of gear next, actually. We've got an exclusive report for you um, by the UK in a changing Europe, looking at what has, well, basically just taking a quick eight-year temperature test of what Brexit has done to various corners of our country, most obviously perhaps, or most pertinently perhaps, the civil service, i.e. What, what, the, what the machinery of government has had to do to accommodate that decision in 2016, which um, the champions of it told you would reduce the need for the machinery of government and reduce regulation and reduce red tape. Time for a reality check after this. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 11.49 is the time. I think we shall invoke the spirit of Graham Stewart just for another moment. Graham Stewart is the Minister for Energy Security and Net Zero who, in response to the base and vile racism of the Tory party donor, um, uh, uh, Frank Hester, has said we should all move on. Now, that's a phrase I hear quite often, normally when I'm pointing out the reality of Brexit. Normally, um, as on yesterday's show, when an actual importer of food comes in to tell us what the actual reality of importing food looks like and indeed reveals that it is already bad and set to get even worse. Um, the list of things that have got worse is pretty long. Arguably, um, it just got longer with the publication of a new in-depth study by UK in a changing Europe, where my guest Jill Rutter is a senior research fellow. So let's start with the with the overview. What, what, what were you aiming to achieve in so this report? So remember back in 2019, Boris Johnson fought that election on that famous slogan of get Brexit done. And we now seem to have entered a time when both political parties want to really sweep Brexit a bit under the carpet, not really talk about it. But if you actually look at the sort of lived reality of Brexit, and you talk about uh, talking about the sort of new border controls, which we're still implementing yesterday, there's still a huge amount of work going on. There's quite a big Brexit hangover uh, that people inside government are grappling with. And one of the things is there's sort of lots of Brexit details where the implementation has been made much worse by the political turbulence 
of the last few years, if you change Secretary of State uh, two or three times a year or even two or three times a, week. a parliament <laughs> or a week, uh, and each of them wants what their own thumbprint on what you're doing, you end up with a sort of zigzag yeah, so it's just all very difficult. It looks to us as though no one has sat down at the centre of government and thought, well, we've done Brexit. That actually was our big promise to the electorate. How are we going to make Brexit really work in a cost-effective way? Um, it's a philosophical challenge before it becomes an economic one because in order to sit down and make things work or in order to sit down and fix things, you have to acknowledge that things are in need of fixing, whereas Brexit supporters uh, in the Conservative Party and beyond were adamant that the... Uh, that the process would would deliver untold benefits and advantages. Why on earth do we need to fix things when when we're, you don't need to fix the sunlit uplands, Jill Rutter? So I think, I mean, if I were, say I were Kemi Badenoch or David Frost uh, in a thought experiment of deep interest, I think I would say, actually, I do need to do things. I've now got these Brexit freedoms. Right. Um, I do need to do some things to reorientate a civil service machine that's been used to 50 years operating inside the EU. I do need actually to do some things to take those opportunities from Brexit. But one of the problems is that the government actually isn't particularly agreed on what those opportunities from Brexit are. So one of the things that comes out in our report is that a huge amount of time and effort in already overburdened Whitehall departments and regulators was taken up with preparing for the retained EU law bill, which you might remember that great thing that was going to clear off that sort of backlog of EU legislation that Theresa May had had transferred over onto the UK statute book to be ready for Brexit. And they were all preparing, going through these lists of what did you need to say for whatever. And then Kemi Badenoch came in, listened to business, changed course and actually said, well, rather than the default being getting rid of everything, our default now is we're going to save everything. Very, very different position. But here's our list of things we're going to get rid of. And one of the things we were told talking to people actually, you know, in the front line of regulation, running these regulators was, well, we could have had a big strategic conversation about how do we want to regulate better? Where are there real opportunities? But actually, we had to spend our time and effort on this big make work activity that then came to nothing. So I think you would say there that, you know, even if you think they're big Brexit dividends, they don't just deliver themselves. That needs a bit of thinking through and working through. And, And if there aren't, you still need to replace the checks and balances, the systems, the machinery that was pulled. Pulled resources with the European Union now have to become autonomous resources, which presumably sees an increase not only in red tape, but also in civil service staff. Yes, I mean, there's undoubtedly been a huge big increase in civil service numbers. It's been, since 2016, civil service numbers have gone up by over 100,000. So they've gone from under 400,000, the result of those cuts under David Cameron and George Osborne. It's almost a handbrake turn. You can see it in all the graphs, and it's now over 500,000. And yet all of the uh, secretly funded uh, lobby groups who insist that we need a smaller state, told us that Brexit would help to deliver a smaller state. An increase of 20 to 25% in civil service staffing rates is the precise opposite of what they promised. I mean, you can't say they're all down to Brexit because no, remember course. COVID, you know, asylum and things like that that aren't yes. Brexit. But say, you know, a third to a half, then that's right. And actually that was always unrealistic because if you have to run a new global visa regime, if you have to institute controls at the borders if you have to run your own trade policy you would hope that the gains from doing that in a better smarter way will bring some dividends but you undoubtedly have to take on those new functions that previously weren't necessary because we didn't have a trade border with the eu Mm. or we were just running a visa scheme for half the numbers and things like that i i i I sat down with hamza yusuf yesterday for the first time the scottish first minister and uh, just something he said just resonated Mm. with me then as i was looking at your report and he, he was talking about where the Westminster went wrong after Brexit mm. and what he would do differently in the event of mm. Scottish independence. And he said we would move as Scotland. We would accept the result, presuming he wins. But we would absolutely make sure that everybody was on board with what was needed to be done in order to make us as efficient and as effective as we could possibly be in the new reality of post-independence. What you're telling me really, or what you're reminding us of or describing, is the absolute failure of the people who won in 2016 to... Uh, to, to embrace the new reality with, with intelligence and 
and design. I think it was a lot of denial about the sort of inevitable consequences of yes. some of the things that you were doing. Of the sort of Brexit that was chosen, had yes. you gone for something more maybe where Theresa May, not at the start, but might have ended up, you know, could have had quite different implications, but we've never had a proper strategic discussion really about that's been done, uh, and, and done internally inside the Conservative Party. If the government's majority rests in part upon the questionable to be polite claim that brexit would be done the response or the rhetoric of saying it is done we need to move on it's over now we need to stop talking about it i I, I mean it begins to make sense but what what this report describes and what you're describing is deep and avoidable damage that is being done or deep and avoidable delay that is being imposed on sectors that that desperately need help. Yes, I think, you know, I think what this shows overall is a lack of strategic grip about Brexit. You know, Brexit, not just a negotiation prox- uh, but project just, to just get to the stress. trade cooperation Sorry, I interrupt agreement. You. I want people listening yeah. to understand. This is, a, this is a sort of Brexit remain proof. It's got nothing to do with whether you thought Brexit was a good idea or not. This is a look at the the reality of yeah. it and and making the best of it whether you think you're making the best of a bad decision or making the best of a good decision at the moment they're not making the best of anything yeah have a plan and actually have the grip and address the real problems that they're there that's the sort of big message of this and it's a message to whoever forms a government because <sighs> well, we'll talk about labor briefly we're going to run out of time can you put a financial figure on it we've got we've got a number of civil servants so very very rough and ready yeah. um based on averages uh we don't do that in the report but around one and a half billion pounds for extra civil servants but just uh, for the wage bill yeah but um, that would be costs i mean some will flow back in taxes and things like that it's quite course. difficult to do those numbers and that figure's not over yet presumably because i keep hearing that we need more border checks harwich is is not ready for fit for purpose yet but they'll need to staff harwich they'll need to staff all of these pallet checkers our friend andreas a greengrocer in chelsea was here yesterday describing the, uh, the paperwork that now needs to be done whether it's online or on paper all of that will need to be checked so there's more more hirings to come presumably potentially more hirings though we end up charging businesses for those checks so they don't show up in more public spending necessarily they may hand add up as a burden on business so what do you want to see and uh, you'll allow me to suggest that you're far too uh, impartial to do so that you're unlikely to see it from the current government but you mentioned both parties failing really to grasp this nettle what what would what could Keir Starmer say and do now that would uh, warm you I think that uh, either party yes. post-election needs to actually think yeah we're now where we are how do we do this efficiently, minimise the costs, and look actually and say, you know, have we got the resources, people, direction in the right places to actually, you know, deliver some of the possibilities of Brexit? And are we being realistic about what those are? That's a fairly straightforward analysis. Jill Rutter, many thanks indeed. Um, uh, you're a member of a UK, senior fellow at the mm. UK in a Changing Europe, which is the hat that you're wearing mm. today. I got confused because you're also at the Institute of Government, yeah. aren't you? Yeah, um, it's not com- my report. Co- no, absolutely not. It's coming up to 12 noon and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. So the civil service is nearly 100,000 people bigger since Brexit, but still no clear vision of what the government's policy may be. Um, That is why we won't be moving on, either as a country or indeed as a radio programme, anytime soon. Um, Still waiting to hear. We heard yet from the Minister for Women and Equalities about this egregious racist abuse of a woman who is uh, an MP. No, we'll look at it. It's probably just about to happen, is it? Kemi Badenoch seems to be popping up quite a lot on this programme at the moment, but I'm sure she'll, uh, she'll get her finger out imminently. After that, I don't know what we'll do. We may get back to this story of Frank Hester. We may have a look at calls for Boris Johnson to return to the front line of politics, but I can't help feeling that we have probably suffered enough. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. Three minutes after 12 is the time. I've got three. Uh, two former MPs, one former advisor. Uh, Alistair Burke, Gavin Barwell and Samuel Kasumu. I, I listen, I don't know how to keep this plate spinning, how to keep this fire burning, but I will. Uh, I'm going to talk about something a little different now, but uh, the case of Frank Hester is not going anywhere as far as I am concerned. But I, I do think throughout the next hour, we could add to that list or not, as the case may be. So I'm currently waiting to hear from the Minister for Women and Equalities about the racist abuse of the first black woman ever elected into the House of Commons. I'll say that again because it's extraordinary. It's why Samuel Kasumi's comments were so poignant. 
as uh, Diane uh, Abbott walked so that people like me and Kemi Badenoch and James Cleverly could run. So Samuel's words, not mine. Uh, Samuel, who resigned as a, an advisor to Boris Johnson over fears that the traffic was heading in precisely the direction that it has now gone. Um, so I've got Alistair Burke, Gavin Barwell, Samuel Kasumi. But listen, there are only two of us keeping an eye on this stuff. So if you have got an other examples of Conservatives, and I think it's going to be past, isn't it? There's not going to be any present. There's not going to be any current members of Parliament who are allowed to come out and say that what this man has done is disgusting and racist and they should give the money back. If there are, they, they can go straight to the top of the list. But I would like the list to be a little longer. I, I'm not doing a phone in today on those Tories who don't quite know what's happened to their party. I've described you often as being among the loneliest people in British politics. In many ways, it's a little bit like being a, a, a traditional Labour supporter was between 2015 and 2019, but in, in many ways, much, much worse. Uh, because I don't think today's the day to do that. But if you can find me, Conservative politicians, past or present, who are simply saying the unvarnished and obvious truth about the awfulness of Frank Hester's comments, then I would like to add them to my list. So here's a weird one, right? Here's a really, really, really weird one. Um, Boris John, I'm going to read you this from the first paragraph of uh, Rupert Murdoch's Times newspaper, edited, of course, by Tony Gallagher, former deputy editor of the Daily Mail, former editor of the Daily Telegraph, and former editor of The Sun. Boris Johnson, oh, and running mate of Boris Johnson. I don't know if you've seen those photographs, uh, but quite often Tony Gallagher at Conservative Party conferences is to be found going for a run with a sort of sweaty-looking Boris Johnson. So uh, you can definitely rely on him to tell you the truth about the man who led us both into Brexit and into um, a, a period of in, 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 almost inconceivable national disgrace. So Tony Gallagher's Times reports today that Boris Johnson is expected to campaign for the Conservatives in red wall seats before the general election after a thawing in relations with Rishi Sunak. Um, I mean, you can probably guess where I'm going with this, but it is an hour for questions rather than the previous two hours of essentially just offering you the space to share your thoughts and feelings about something that brooks no debate, something that brooks no dissent, something that is objectively awful. So the Times claims, and Stephen Swinford, the political editor, is a very reliable reporter. He writes that Johnson allies, which pretty much means Johnson, and senior government sources confirmed that the former Prime Minister was expected to play a significant role in the general election campaign. And it focused my thoughts on something that had been bubbling under the surface for a while with regards to Boris Johnson. And it's something quite surprising, actually. Forgive me, because I, I, I know it's annoying sometimes, uh, and sometimes I do it when I don't really need to, and I promised I'd dial it down a little bit before the 25th of April when the paperback comes out but in my in the book I've got out at the moment there are 10 chapter headings there are 10 people that I consider to be most responsible for the breaking of Britain some of them are obvious and some of them are not Boris Johnson would be among the most obvious right if you're looking at the state that the country was in by 2023 by the beginning of 2023 Boris Johnson is going to have his fingerprints all over many of the biggest problems that we are facing but not only the the reintroduction of racism into the mainstream of the conservative party and of course the removal of honest or at least honourable politicians from the Parliamentary Conservative Party, two of whom are, of course, among the only Tories today to come out and condemn the racism of Frank Hester, but, but also the madness of Brexit, the uh, complete delinquency, the lack of concern for anything or anybody except himself, the obvious and, and egregious proof that Boris Johnson's interests extend no further than the end of Boris Johnson's nose. The, the catastrophe of his COVID handling, the, the, the disaster of bringing Dominic Cummings into the heart of government, the, um, the, the, the circumstances of his departure from the House of Commons are almost unbelievable in their 
uh, in their corruption. You know, he, he, he went because he was found by a committee of his peers featuring a majority of Conservative MPs to have lied to the House of Commons. And then subsequently he lied about lying to the House of Commons. And when presented with the inevitability of a recall petition, he didn't seek to defend himself or fight for his seat in Uxbridge and Ryslip. He left the House of Commons altogether, the political equivalent of taking your ball home. And the man ended his prime ministerial career in pathetic disgrace to the point where he was finally ejected by his own membership, by his own party. Ejected ultimately not for lying about parties or any of the other things he's lied about over the course of his career, both inside Downing Street and outside, but ultimately the straw that broke the camel's back was his, was his lies about the promotion of a man that he knew to be on the receiving end of several sex pest allegations. That, that, that was a pretty small straw in the great context of Boris Johnson's career. But it was for the likes of Rishi Sunak and Sajid Javid, who I think were the first to break cover, it was enough of a straw to break the camel's back. And it ultimately ushered, well, originally Liz Truss and subsequently Rishi Sunak into Downing Street. So he's an obvious contender for a, um, a place on a list of the people who broke Britain, how they broke Britain. But out of all 10 of them, Johnson is the one who, to me, seems to have slipped furthest away from relevance. It's really odd, this. And, and I, I, I wouldn't even have thought about it if I hadn't been updating the book for the paperback. But Johnson feels to me to be like a bad dream now. That even trust, the consequences of trust remain because she hasn't gone away. She's sort of doubled down on her economic madness. And with the support of all the Tufton Street vampires, she's allowed to pretend relevance. She's allowed to pretend re pertinence. And she hasn't left Parliament, of course. The, the, the media players and the think tank players, Dominic Cummings, I suppose, is the only competition Boris Johnson has for having sunk from relevance. But remember that Boris Johnson didn't care whether Brexit went through or not. He just did what he thought would be best for him. So in the end, he thought that supporting Leave would suit his ambitions better than supporting Remain. Dominic Cummings was the one who thought that there was some uh, Elysian field. There was some sunlit uplands. Dominic Cummings was the one that thought that it would improve our country's fortunes immeasurably. So for me, that, that legacy, the legacy of Brexit has more to do with the media figures in how they broke Britain, the Paul Dakers, the Rupert Murdochs, the Andrew Neils, than it does with the political figures. The, the Boris Johnson is the only one, actually, and David Cameron, who, of course, didn't want it to happen, but who's incompetent as a prime minister and whose arrogance as a human being and whose hubris as a, as a politician was the large parts of the reason why why it actually happened why we ended up in this silly old mess that we ended up in so i'm putting it to you and this is the kryptonite of radio phonies for me this is the one topic that whenever i have to speak to students or um uh, uh, producers about what works and what doesn't work this is the one thing that i say you should never ever do on the radio because i don't think people care about boris johnson anymore and the one thing you should never do on the radio is say, give me a ring if you don't care about the topic that we're discussing. But you know me, you don't have to be zany to work here, but it helps. Hey, 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 rules are made to be broken. Am I right? Am I right? Am I right? I, I, I'll make it a little bit more sophisticated than that. You, you look at somebody like Nadine Dorries, um, not, not for too long because your retina will burn, but you look at somebody like Nadine Dorries and you see her insisting that the country wants Boris Johnson to come back, glossing over the lies, glossing over the deaths, glossing over the, the corruption, glossing over the, the myriad, myriad examples of his personal and political awfulness. You look at someone like Nadine Dorries and you know that, uh, and also, I mean, he let her down in the end. He lets everybody down ultimately. Poor old Nadine's not in the House of Lords, much to her fury. And you, and you know that not that long ago, there was a constituency that Nadine Dorries represented. I don't mean in Bedfordshire, um, uh, the, the one that she resigned from and then didn't resign for two months or three months. I mean a constituency of people across the country who thought that Boris Johnson was somehow their man. I think that has withered. I could be wrong. It's not a personal preference. I, I, I mean, I think it might be useful to... The Labour Party, if, if Boris Johnson goes out campaigning for the Tory party, I don't know. But I think what I see 
when I read that the former Prime Minister is likely to be deployed in the north of England and the Midlands, I see a London-based Tory party saying to themselves that those thickos in the regions, those plebs in the provinces, they're still going to fall for Boris Johnson's shtick. Just pause for a moment and think about what this story says about Rishi Sunak. Rishi Sunak decided that Boris Johnson's moral corruption and personal unsuitability were disqualifying factors, and I grant you it took him a long time to get there, but they eventually became disqualifying factors for him to continue to be Prime Minister. So Rishi Sunak is clever enough. Rishi Sunak is well-informed enough. Rishi Sunak is well-educated enough to see Boris Johnson for exactly what he is, uh, a self-obsessed, corrupt fraud. But the voters in the North and the voters in the Midlands, well, they still think he's great because they're not very bright or they're not very well informed or they've been groomed and gaslit for so long by the likes of Dacre, who gave Johnson a column in the mail, or Murdoch, who's got a front page story about him coming back to help campaign in the Red Wall, that these Northerners, these thick brummies, these daft Northerners, they still love a bit of Boris. The Parliamentary Conservative Party threw, his, threw him out on his ear. He was so persuaded that the good burghers of Uxbridge and Ryslip would send him packing that he didn't even have the guts to fight an election there or to take a recall petition. He, he, he left office in high, this unprecedented disgrace, more disgrace than any other prime minister, possibly ever. I haven't got the history to say that for certain, but for sure in living memory. And now we read in Rupert Murdoch's Times that he's going to join the election campaign in the Red Wall. I'm going to do something now that I should do more often. You're not allowed to ring me if you're in London. You're not allowed to ring me if you are in the South East. You are only allowed... To, in fact, you're not even allowed to ring me if you're in Scotland. You are... Although I've got a special full disclosure for you at the end of this week, so um, calm down. I only want to hear from people in the North of England and in the Midlands. Because the message today to you is this. Boris Johnson could persuade you to vote Tory. You are currently not intending to. You did so in 2019 because reasons. You believed him when he lied about an oven-ready deal. You believed him when he lied about getting Brexit done. You believed him when he lied about sunlit uplands. You believed him when he lied about making Brexit great again. You now see that you've been lied to. And therefore, you're not going to vote for the party that Boris Johnson led to an 80-seat majority which is a problem for his successor, Rishi Sunak. But, my little northern friend, so boiled are your brains on whippets and flat caps that if they send Boris Johnson and his pantomime toff act back to Newcastle, back to Leeds, back to Manchester, back to Birmingham, back to Dudley, back to Wolverhampton, then you can be persuaded back into the Tory fold because Boris Johnson is still possessed of whatever magic dust it was that persuaded you to vote for him in the first place. So I'm only taking calls from the north of England and the Midlands. And the question you will answer is this. Is Boris Johnson a busted flush? Is Boris Johnson a soaking wet squib? Is Boris Johnson... A flat balloon, a burst football. Toast. I, I really, really think he is. I don't know about Wales, Julius. I'm not excluding Wales on purpose. I just don't know if... I don't think Wales counts as the Red Wall. And the Times reports that they're sending him to the north of England and the Midlands. So that's the, that's the constituencies that I'm interested in today. If you hit the numbers now, you can tell me whether or not Boris Johnson still carries electoral salience for you in other words are you the voter that rishi sunak has in mind when he arrives at the conclusion that sending boris johnson to the north of england and the midlands would actually be good for the tories at the next election because I, I mean this is one of those areas where my own biases may have blinded me to reality maybe there are millions of little nadine dorises running out out there running around out there convinced that boris johnson didn't do any of the terrible things that we know he did and poised to vote tory as a consequence of him getting re-involved in the election campaign 
So 18 minutes after 12 is the time. That, that, is the, I can't, that is the question that I'd like you to answer. I'm fairly confident, I'd, well, I'd say 52% to 48, that Boris Johnson, his, his, his bolt is shot. He doesn't, he doesn't make me angry anymore. He used to make me furious because of the damage he was doing to a country that I love. He doesn't make me angry anymore. I don't know quite, it just makes me roll my eyes. Very much contempt for the con men, compassion for the con. Boris Johnson should never have been allowed anywhere near high office. He should never have been allowed anywhere near Downing Street. Everything he touched turned to shocking amounts of sewage in his hands. I, I, I mean, literally, the, the legacy of Boris Johnson is Liz Truss. The legacy of Boris Johnson is waters full of shocking amounts of sewage. It's, it's, it's Brexit. It's increased cost of living. Everything he touched turned rotten in his hands. And yet the contention this morning is that he can, he can win votes over. So come at that from any angle you like. I think if you are a 30p Lee fan, I think the calculation here is Boris Johnson can tempt you back. I can't see that they think he's going to tempt anybody back from the middle ground or from the left of centre or from the centre. But that's what I just, I want you to know, all right? And I may allow you to ring in from elsewhere, but here's, here's the question. Why would Rishi's two questions, right? Pay attention. Why would Rishi Sunak think that Boris Johnson carried clout in the North and the Midlands? 03456060973. And as a voter in the North and the Midlands, does Boris Johnson still carry clout? You can speak for yourself or you can speak for the people around you. You can ring me and say, James, I can't believe it and it pains me to say it, but at work, I reckon if Johnson got involved, there's at least half a dozen of my colleagues who would vote Tory instead of replace or, or, or re re relent or reform or whatever they're calling themselves this week. All right, hit the numbers now, you will get through. 0345 6060 973. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 24 minutes after 12. Any word yet from the Women and Equalities Minister on the racist abuse of the first black woman to be elected into the House of Commons? Have we got anything yet from Kemi? Bad or not? Nothing? Okay. Uh, Natasha's gone to lobby, has she? She'll be bringing us up to date, I hope. Before, before we give it five minutes, we'll catch up with Natasha Clark, our LBC political editor. Um, Boris Johnson, uh, to join election campaign in Red Wall. I, I, I just want to know what you think about that, especially if you're in the Red Wall, the North or the Midlands. It wasn't just revising my book for the paperback edition. It was also this documentary on Channel 4, The Rise and Fall of Boris Johnson. I was very surprised by my reaction to it. Uh, as someone who correctly and very quickly and early chronicled just how awful he would be for the country. And I was in a very powerful position to do that because I fell for his shtick back in 2008 when he ran for mayor of London. I very, very briefly fell for it. So I have the zeal of a convert, but also I have sympathy for people who fell for it later and perhaps didn't see the light as quickly as I did. And, and I watched this documentary on Channel 4 and my response really took me by surprise because even, even when he was treating our country like a personal plaything and treating our traditions and our values with complete contempt, even while he was doing that, I could see the act. I could see why it worked. Watching the rise and fall of Boris Johnson on Channel 4, I couldn't quite believe that anybody ever fell for it. And I don't mean me because I woke up to it in 2008, about a month after voting for him to be mayor of London. Um, I, I think that he is a busted flush, but I could, of course, be wrong. I have been in the past, and I, and I will be again in the future, but am I wrong today? Declan's in Wigan. Declan, what do you think? Hey, James. Um, uh, I couldn't actually agree more personally with you on that. Um, I'm looking forward to him if he does actually come up north. Because, <laughs> uh, have a little welcoming chance. committee. Yeah, um, I think that'll be probably a surprise to his ego. Uh, I remember a couple of years before he was Tory leader, yes. uh, me and my missus saw him in Chester. Um, and I was saying to your researcher then, it was like a comedian had a free podium in the middle of a city. Yeah. Um, and he's just making people laugh, making them feel good about themselves. And that's obviously before... We knew yes. what he was really yeah, But like. that's a nice uh, description, uh, making people feel good about themselves or to feel good about the world. I mean, partly the, yeah. the, the, the appeal of not taking anything seriously is that it helps you not to take things seriously too until you realise, A, that we should be taking things seriously and B, that the man who wants to be Prime Minister should be taking them more seriously than everybody else. Yeah, absolutely. I always think, like, politicians, especially the higher up you get up the ladder, 
Um, they should be like a good referee uh, in like a rugby game. So you'll never notice a good referee at all um, because they're doing the job <laughs> wrong. Whereas yes. in this case, the more you notice, the referee obviously is doing a bad job. And, you know, I want the politicians to be boring. Um, I want them to tell us what their party is going to do. Um, I'm not into the blood slinging uh, between the two parties as well, especially as you've seen what's happened with Diane Abbott as well yes. today. Um, so what will happen? I mean, it, 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 is there mileage, though, among other people, among your friends or your colleagues? Do you think that bringing Johnson back onto the pitch to carry on with the football analogies would give the team a boost? <laughs> uh, in a small percentage, potentially, yeah. Um, but the majority of the people up north, I think, in the red wall, you know, where... Lee is now our champion, apparently, comes to Richard Tice. Um, I, th- I think the Tories are just completely done. I mean, my dad, my dad's been Tory all his life. He's completely done with him. Um, if he's not going to vote Labour, he said the only other option is going to spoil his vote, which I'll advocate against, you of know, course. because yeah, I'm not going to tell my dad what to do. I'll just, you know, tell him what I think. Um, but yeah, uh, what, what's the, the what, what? What do we think that when you talk about the small percentage, who, who are these people? They're not currently intending to vote Labour, and then they send Boris Johnson to Wigan, and they all decide to suddenly vote Tory. So they're either decide they're either planning not to vote at all, or they're planning to vote for the outfit that Thirty P joined yesterday. Yeah, uh, it's, it's so just hang on, wait there. I'm just going to check. Is he still in that party, Thirty P? Lee, is he still in that? Is it? That, he is apparently. No, carry on, Declan. He is apparently still in that party. <laughs> it's, it's just the people who I think enjoy the comedy factor that he brings. Yeah. You know, he's he is a large than life person, uh, which is something he's definitely got going for him. Don't get me wrong. No, definitely uh, still. But, so people who don't, perhaps you know, don't pay that much attention to politics, but they quite liked him last time, and therefore if he's around again this time, they might like him again. Although exactly. he won't be the he won't be the leader, so it's questionable how much influence he'll yeah. have, how yeah. much impact. Again, he'll have. I was saying to your researcher, it's as yeah. if they think that we don't have TVs up north. We're more <laughs> as informed as everybody else. Um, so we're, you know, we're, we're going we're gonna, to gonna vote with our heads, I, I like to think, and, you know. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I, I probably shouldn't encourage too much speculation on what the thinking of the Tories is, but I, I've already talked about flat caps and whippets just to bring in some very lazy northern stereotypes to, to, to support the idea that they're patronising you at best and insulting you at worst. But I, I guess you look at the 80-seat majority in 2019 and you acknowledge that Johnson was a big part of that. But you also understand, and this is what I mean by not paying attention, that he was a big part of that because he was so good at lying. So when you talk about him being, or when Declan and I talk about him having charisma or winning characteristics, he's very, very good at lying. The one thing nobody, however much you criticise Boris Johnson, the one thing you can never argue with is the fact he's a brilliant, brilliant liar. He, he's, he's, you know, he's, he's a goat when it comes to lying. He's one of the greatest liars of all time, politically speaking. But he's not selling lies this time. He would be there. The things that he sold them last time have turned to rubbish in their hands. Uh, Brexit hasn't been done. It wasn't oven ready. So I, I, I just don't know. Apart from this tiny constituency of people that Declan descri- who Declan describes, who basically just see him as a sort of Eric Morecambe tribute act, who's going to change their vote as a consequence of Boris Johnson getting involved? It's half past 12. Amelia Cox is here now with your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 12.34 is the time. I'll tell you how awful they are. I, I haven't even had room this week, last week, when was it, to comment on the fact that the Secretary of State for Education said she'd punch an off-com inspector. Did you see that story? Did you see that story? Did you see that story? No, but I, Christ, I hope I didn't imagine it. I'd have to issue an apology. What? Was it a dream? Like you I, I hope talking not. about it earlier. Can, can, can we just Google that quickly? I'm sure, sure the Secretary of State for it would be a very odd dream to have, LBC political editor Natasha Clark. But I am fairly confident that I saw something of, 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 to, to that end. Um, uh, we better, better double check. Uh, who is the Minister for Women and Equalities? It's Kemi Badenoch, isn't it? Excellent. And what she said so far about the violent abuse. She's not said of, anything as far as I'm aware. Don't be silly. She, she must have done. She, she's very hard to shut her up most of the time. She's always banging on about non-existent trade deals. I'm just going to check her Twitter. If you would, sure thank you. It's all live. She's here. not. You know, what? She's not said anything. Well, but in she's the, last the minister for women and equalities, Natasha. I know, and she's not said anything so far. Oh. Well, what has the We've MP? Asked. What We've has asked. the prime minister's spokesperson said? I would say something, but actually, no, not a lot either. 
Um, that was a very excruciatingly difficult lobby briefing so, for well, you've the been Prime at, Minister. You've been at the I, I was lobby listening. Briefing. I was listening right, to it online. Tuned in. Um, number 10 spokesperson has said that Frank Hester's comments are unacceptable, but has refused to describe them as racist and doesn't say why they are unacceptable. Now, this very much feels like last week, Groundhog Day with yes. Lee Anderson, doesn't yes, it? It's it exactly the same playbook. Well, with one crucial difference, which we'll come to. So tell us why it's the same. Well, it's the same because they're saying they're unable to say why it is that these comments are unacceptable yeah. and wrong, just repeating the same line, unacceptable, wrong, round and round and surface, and again refusing to say that they're racist. Last week it was refusing to say they were Islamophobic, what Lee Anderson said. Um, the Prime Minister spokesperson also refused to comment in detail because they said that these comments are hypothetical comments because they haven't been able to hear a recording of them. But he's apologised for them. But he's apologised for them. Is that a hypothetical apology? Exactly. They've said, the, the spokesperson said, we're not, we wouldn't usually comment on source reports, but what is an alleged to have been said, those comments in their, entire, in their entirety would be unacceptable. But they were not saying they're racist and they're not saying exactly what it is that Frank Hester is, is alleged to have said yeah. is unacceptable. And yes, we're just going to go round and round in circles, I think, again today with ministers being asked again on the medium, medium round, are these comments racist? And if so, why would you not be able to explain why on earth they are unacceptable? Well, in the case of 30p, I could answer that question. And and it was f number one. What I said Ofsted, didn't I? What did you think I said? What did I say? Ofcom. Of course she's not going to punch someone from Ofcom. She's going to punch someone from Ofsted, the, the education secretary. God, I misspoke. Give me a break. I've got to do all this on my own, honestly. Where was I? Frank Hester. There you go. And Lee so Anderson. So the big difference here is that Lee Anderson had been slung out. They actually did disassociate themselves from Lee Anderson. Yes, and they haven't disassociated themselves from Frank Hester. And secondly, the reason why they couldn't explain why 30p was being Islamophobic was because any analysis which concluded, or any analysis which acknowledged his Islamophobia, would have applied equally well to Suella Braverman's more recent and arguably more obnoxious comments. So neither of those things apply here, which means I can only think, I don't know about you, I can only think of 10 million reasons why they're not doing what yes. they should do. And um, the Conservative Party have refused as well to answer questions on whether Frank Hester is actually a Conservative Party member. Now, you might assume that those two do come hand in hand if you're giving to the Conservative Party that you would be a Conservative Party member. We don't know that because they're not answering those questions at the moment. We're not, we've not got an answer from that because that raises this, the, the idea, well, actually, if his comments are unacceptable, if they are wrong, would you like to suspend his membership of mm. the Conservative Party? And that might be a, a rightful question that they ask. But yes, everybody so far has dodged uh, questions on whether they will give back that money uh, and what it means. And, you know, Labour and the Liberal Democrats are calling for that £10 million to be given back. But so far, I don't, I haven't seen any Tories that have been agreeing with that fact. He is one of the largest donors to the Conservative Party. He's donated £5 million this year and I think another £5 million last year. Yes, this is the man right. that's going to be bankrolling the next Conservative election campaign. Is that, is that a significant enough sum, is it? That, yeah, that is, he I is... believe he is the biggest Conservative donor at least this year. Wow. So that's probably the beginning and the end of our analysis, isn't it? Is that if they tell him to sling his hook, they'll be fighting the election with rubber bands and, and empty toilets. Exactly. And Labour have been doing, obviously, understandably, much better at their um, donations in the past few years as many businesses start to flock back to them and many people see them as the party that will win the next election. They are raking in more donations than they have been for a long time and, f and rivaling the Conservatives on many of their donations. So, yes, I think if they were to give back a staggering £10 million, it would leave a huge hole in their party coffers with which they need to fight an election in just a few months. Although Gavin Barwell has said what you do in these situations is, is plug the hole with donations from more fair-minded donors, but they're probably quite thin on the ground at the moment. I imagine they are. I imagine yeah. it's, it's been particularly hard, especially as many people are flocking over to Labour, and we've, we've heard many people, including the, the former Iceland chief executive, say that they would now like to fund the Labour Party as well, and obviously he comes with his, uh, his baggage, having cons tried and failed to become a Conservative candidate himself. Richard Walker was his name, correct me if yes, I'm wrong. Yes, I think it was. Um, but yes, it would create a huge hole in those coffers if they were to if they were to give back their donation. And I just do not think they'd be able to plug it from somewhere so, else. So the sensible donors being tempted towards Labour and the insensible donors being tempted towards 30p Lee's outfit. Presumably there's, there's some money sloshing around Richard there, Tice has been saying in the past few hours, and uh, past few days rather, that he has had um, an influx of, of smaller members to the party, which obviously give a much smaller amount of was money. Was he talking about Lee Anderson? Yeah. <laughs> That was very rude. 
very rude. Uh, he was talking about how he has gathered more members to the Reform Party in the last few days since Lee Anderson's defection, which gives it not much money, but it gives him a little bit of extra money, a few thousand pounds extra in the coffers for the party. Are, and are, are there other sources for the Tories? Because uh, do you know who's just given £100,000 to the Jeremy Hunt re-election campaign? Is it Jeremy Hunt himself? It, it is indeed the same, the self-same Jeremy Hunt. So Rishi Sunak could comfortably give £10 million quid to the Tory party s- campaign and barely notice it. I believe, I don't, I don't know what the rules are. No, I don't either. On, I know that you could, you can obviously donate to your own local party conserv- but uh, not like to conservatives, send, maybe but I'm not, not sure if you can. I'm not sure what the rules are about you donating directly to CCHQ's operation. What do your instincts tell you, Natasha, about this one? Because they sat out Michelle Donnellan, didn't they, and her £15,000 worth of taxpayers' money used to pay off a libel case being brought by someone she'd accused with no justification whatsoever of supporting Hamas. They, they kind of sat out Anderson's Islamophobia, even though he rewarded them by uh, infecting to the Relent, Reform, Reclaim party. And now they're trying to sit this one out as well. Graham Stewart already saying we should move on. Other other um, the, the, the Tory supporters, former Tory ch- treasurer or, or Tory ministers, Mel Stride, they're, they're going to try and sit it out. It sounds like it from the way that they're saying that we need to move on was the phrase I think that Mel Stride used and using the phrase that he did not intend for these comments to be racist or sexist when I think anybody who is looking at them <laughs> truly cannot understand why they're using this argument. And, you know, on Lee Anderson, they did eventually come around and there was ministers that said, actually, this is why what he said was wrong. I think it was Chris Philp after a, the day after a disastrous interview with a fellow minister on, on Nick Ferrari, yes. where he refused and just said it's wrong 10 times. And um, Nick understandably got very frustrated with him and terminated that interview. Eventually, the next day... But none Chris, of it mattered in the great scheme of things. But Chris Philp eventually did come out and say, this is wrong. This is why it is wrong. This mm. is why these comments are unacceptable. And I fear we are in the stage where, you know, number 10 will throw out some some ministers to the slaughter over the next few days and one of them will eventually have to say what it is that these comments are so so wrong and you know like I say I don't don't see the questions going away about this guy why is he is he a member of the Conservative Party and if so why has he not had his membership membership suspended for these comments which are allegedly unacceptable according Uh, to number 10 uh, uh, unacceptable but we can't tell you why and there, there is the echo of 30p ringing loud throughout the corridors of Conservative Party and members. Michael Gove is meant to be um, making an announcement on extending the definition of extremism later this week, and I don't know whether this row helps or hinders that ra- that row. Well, it depends whether he considers ca- calling for a politician to be shot to be an example of extremism or not. You'd think it? so, wouldn't you? You'd hope so. But certainly. I, I, I imagine, I, I, as far as I understand, I don't know if Michael Gove is going to be delivering a speech or not. He'll be be speaking to MPs in the House of Commons, but ministers are not going to be able to to hide away from this one all week. Um, Kwasi Kwarteng, former Chancellor, uh, he has said, to his credit, I suppose, they are clearly racist and they are clearly sexist. They were very stupid remarks, but I think he fought shy of calling for the money to be returned for reasons that are becoming, well, for 10 million reasons that are becoming ever more obvious. Um, thank you, Natasha. We should continue to keep a close eye on this story. And, uh, and I mean, you mentioned ministers coming forward to speak. I, I was only being slightly tongue-in-cheek when you sat down when I asked where the Minister for Women and Equalities is. If this mm. isn't smack in the middle of her brief, then frankly, I don't know what is. Yeah, and you'd expect her to be saying something on this, wouldn't you? We should. And we have asked. We should. Well, let me know if you hear back. It's coming up to quarter to one. Back to, I, I'll take Richard and Lee first after the next hiatus because, I, I, I mean, listen, I don't know whether it's proof of my point or not, but I just don't feel, you say Boris Johnson, I say meh. Whereas for 15 years, you say Boris Johnson, I say, Rrr. I say Boris Johnson, you go, wee. So his ability to excite a strong reaction has been something upon which almost everybody has been able to agree. My theory this morning is that apart from Nadine Dorries, Boris, Lons- Boris Johnson has lost his ability to excite a strong reaction in anybody. Even those of us who have chronicled his corruption tirelessly on the radio and in books and elsewhere... Even even we now just go, oh, come on, yesterday's news. So the suggestion that he's going to join the election campaign because red wall voters will still be susceptible to his dubious charms is one that we will examine a little further. With your help on 0345 973 after this. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. I wasn't imagining it. I, I may have said off com instead of off stead. 
I mean, crikey, punching Ofsted people would be bad enough, but punching Ofcom people, that should be... A, I mean, I'd bring back the death penalty for that sort of thing. You've got to show Ofcom the respect they deserve at all opportunity, every, every and any opportunity. But things are so bonkers now for Rishi Sunak's ludicrous government that the education secretary can tell head teachers that she would be tempted to punch Ofsted inspectors uh, without anybody really noticing. I literally just looked around the studio. I looked at the political editor. I looked at the producer. I looked at Keith. And admittedly, in Keith's case, it's not a massive shock. But none of them had, had heard hide nor hair of this story. Not Neither hide nor hair. So much so, so blank were their faces that I actually thought I'd made a terrible mistake and I was going to have to issue an apology to Gillian Keegan before close of play today. There it is. I mean... Uh, essentially saying that if she was a teacher she'd have she'd have punched Ofsted inspectors anyway Boris Johnson what do you reckon Richard's in Shrewsbury Richard what would you like to say so in Shropshire we are sort of in the West Midlands but I don't think you could call us in the Red Wall um, but it because, says the Midlands it says the, mid- the yeah, Midlands so we are we are in the, the Midlands, Midlands. Yeah. Um, turned into Prince I, Charles for some reason the Midlands <laughs> we are in the Midlands carry on in the Midlands um, I don't think it would be wise for Boris Johnson to turn up in Shrewsbury and ask people to vote Conservative. Um, we Shropshire has 25% of people over 65, um, so it was. It's also very rural, so a lot of people were affected by COVID and yes. by COVID measures like lockdown. You know that was that was a big deal for you know if you live in the middle of nowhere, which a lot of Shropshire is, um, and. Um, in a good way. He lied, in a and good he way. partied, and he lied. Yeah, yes. in a lovely way, yeah. But, um, but had, and and, and, and really the polling, people the forget floor. that when they got rid of him, the polling was through the floor. I mean, it was around the levels that it is now. So I suppose you could use that as an example of, um, you know, nothing ventured, nothing nothing to lose. But he was his personal popularity was rock bottom, and yet people like Nadine Dorries talk as if he's the second coming. Well, Nadine Dorries is, is a very special person. Um, That's very true. She's, she's unique, thankfully. Um, but in addition to, to COVID, you know, Owen Patterson is the MP for uh, our friends to the, just north of here, North was. Russia, or was, was sorry, yeah. was, was. And, you know, that is on people's minds. That doesn't, um, it doesn't make the Conservative Party look good, does it? Boris Johnson was the one who tried to to get that that's another one of his greatest hits to, yeah. yeah he breaks our, bo- um, our boy broke the rules so the problem is the rules not our boy absolutely and i think uh, i might be being overly kind to to my fellow slopians but i think that the conservatives around here are more traditional more small c conservative i don't think that they are particularly right wing um, for conservatives, you know, I think they are more the Which dominant you, you, you tempt us into, zone. yes, no, I, I, I mean, you do tempt us into slightly tricky territory here because, you, you know, I want to say, which voters is it that they are hoping to attract with the Boris Johnson card by resurrecting Boris Johnson? And, 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 and I don't want to say the silly ones, but it is perhaps the ones who don't know the full details or don't remember rather than don't care well, about the Owen Patterson story or about the lies yeah. to the House of Commons or about all the parties. And I just can't believe there are many people out there who, who don't well, know yeah, about all this. The other thing about um, the Shropshire demographic is Shropshire is, is the whitest place I've ever lived in, in, in my life. It's is it? 93.8% white, mm. I think, or something like that. Anyway, um, and when asylum seekers had to be um, given uh, housing in a local hotel, uh, there was a bomb threat. So yeah. it's probably those people that they're trying to appeal to, the, Boris Johnson. The people that threaten they to are bomb a, a minority. Centers. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Including know. children at the time. <sighs> Happy days. Well, at least there weren't any murals for them to look at. Um, thanks to Robert Jenrick. Thank you. I like that, Rich. I also, actually, while you're here... And while I'm in a slightly mischievous mood, uh, how, would you agree with... Well, you probably would because you live there. I, I think Shropshire, <laughs> Shropshire and Worcestershire are the most underrated counties in Britain. Uh, well, I lived in Birmingham most of my life and I chose to move to Shropshire. Yeah, there it is. Um, uh, I get to walk my kids along the River Seven to their primary school every day. Yeah, you see. Um, and as a part of my job, I get to drive around the county a lot visiting young people. And yeah, I've got... Very few complaints. Oh, well, I, I mean, I grew up in Worcestershire, and I think I, and, you know, Kidderminster is a bit of a post-industrial hellscape, but the county is at, at large 
parts of it just are in the Cotswolds. Everyone goes on about Stow on the Wold and Gloucestershire. I suppose it's an easier hop from London, but it's seriously, in the days of working from home and getting more bang for your buck, you could do a lot worse than move into the beautiful, beautiful countryside of Worcestershire and Shropshire. And I, they're not even paying me for saying that. Um, here it is. Here's Gillian Keegan uh, doing her little bit for relations. I heard recently, actually, a fantastic school I went into, um, and, and they said, they told me how the officer, you know, their officer experience had gone, and I was shocked. I mean, I was actually shocked. I thought, God, if I'd have met these people, I'd have probably punched them. They were really rude. That's fine. Yeah, nothing to see here. Just the Secretary of State for Education saying that if she'd been inspected by Ofsted inspectors who have a fairly tough job, albeit that they come in for a lot of justified criticism, she'd have punched them. I wonder what she's going to do to Frank Hester when she bumps into him at the next Conservative fundraising dinner. What do we think? Any any thoughts? Would she, I mean, if you're going to get punched for being rude to teachers, what are you going to get for calling for an MP, calling one of your colleagues to be shot? Gillian Keegan? Let's see if we can get hold of her. Kemi's clearly busy. If you're going to punch someone for being rude to a teacher, what are you going to do to someone who calls for one of your colleagues to be shot, Jill? Any work? Can, uh, yeah, give us a buzz. Give us a buzz. Give us a ring. No one ever gives you the credit they deserve. Is that, oh, is she the one that complained about never get? No, I'll, I'll give you the credit you deserve, Gillian Keegan. If you tell me that if, if, if you live in a universe where being rude to a teacher deserves a punch on the nose, what does calling for a colleague to be shot get? You could perhaps check with the Minister for Women and Equalities before you ring in. Uh, where am I going next? Manchester or Jarrow? Manchester. Manchester. Manchester or Jarrow? Manchester. So much to answer for. What do we think, Lee? Correct. Manchester. Manchester. Yeah. <laughs> perfect segue, James. I'm leader tattoo teacher who bumped into you. A, a oh, few good to back. hear from you again, Lee. How are you doing? Yeah. I, I'm, I'm good. I'll have good. to be quite quick. The kids are on the way back in in five minutes. Um, <laughs> perfect segue with Gillian Keegan, by the way. <laughs> have you ever been tempted to. Put, don't answer that well, question, we Tom. Had off, we had off, I've had Ofsted. Uh, I, I worked at a different school. I've come to a different school in September, so I've been Ofsteaded twice right. in the last. Uh, six months. Crikey. First experience was great. They couldn't have been more helpful. Second example, I think it would, it's a good job I didn't take a leaf out of Julian Keegan's book, but because yes. I would be now out of a job. Yes, but, uh, but yeah, you'd they, probably they be out of it. The nicest. Even for saying it, to be honest with you, but then <clears> again, exactly. you're not a member of the cabinet, you're just a teacher. Exactly, <sighs> yeah. Anyway, back to um, our friend Johnson. Johnson. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I think there is, there is that con- constituency that, no matter how small it might be, who have got short memories not that well i don't want to be disrespectful not i don't mean not informed but mm. they do just fall for what are we supposed to hate or fear this week yeah thanks to the daily mail and i think he is probably the only politician as you keep acknowledging that he's a brilliant liar he's, he's very charismatic mm. i think he could come up with new lies different lies he could just change his narrative and i think that with the right-wing press could be enough to get you know, not a, a significant number, but certainly start sort of moving the gauge slightly. Because he'll just he'll just do what he always does. He'll just choose sound bites. You know, stoke the culture wars. Be nostalgic. What's in about it for things. him? I don't. Well, he's because he's, he's just a massive narcissist, isn't he? Yeah. At the end of the day, and uh, so I think it, just the fact that he's 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 news again. You know, after being humbled somewhat. But I'm I'm a member of it. I mean, I'm a member of a golf, of a golf club. And it's like being in Manchester. It's the closest one to Manchester City Centre. Oh, it's yeah. only three, four miles from the centre. And it's a, a very working class area, a very working class demographic. People who don't play golf think, and you're probably one of them back in the day, I would imagine, <laughs> that it's all pompous Tories who are rich and blah, blah, blah. It's Hang not on a minute. Some of my best friends play golf. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's a working pens club yes. with, a, with an 18 old golf course in, in the back garden, basically. Right. But there's the vast majority of those blokes there, you know, would never vote Labour. The vast majority is strong, but there's a, there's a high percentage, most notably the older guys, yeah. who would never vote Labour. They hate Angela Rayner. Yeah. My nickname is uh, Jeremy in there. Is it? Because Cause you're the I'm lefty. Like, yeah, I'm the lefty and I'm the woke one, you know, and, and honestly, I thank, thank the your working three class Tory. They're, 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 I mean, yeah. they are the <clears throat> people that Bevan was talking about when he described the project of 20th century conservatism to persuade, um, you know, the workers to, to use their political power to keep wealth in power. You've got, you've got, how many kids have you got to usher back into the school now? Well, that's a, a bit of a sickness bug going around, so I'm, I'm a bit low today. I've only got 24. So, right, well, good uh, luck. 
Have a good one. Well, good yeah, to hear from yeah. you, Lee. We'll yes, speak. James, I'll see you again care. soon. Take care. Coming up to 12.59. You've been listening to James O'Brien on LBC. That's it for another day. If you missed any of today's show, you can listen back on Catch Up on Global Player, the official LBC app, where you can also pause and rewind live radio. Download it now for free from your app store or just go to globalplayer.com. Um, just before I hand over to Sheila, have we heard from the Minister for Women and Equalities? No? Nothing? Oh. Lewis Goodall with you at four. Sheila Fogarty with you now. Thank you, James. James O'Brien on LBC.